I'm Kate Ford and uh, the president of the school board and we have concluded closed session for this evening. It's Tuesday, August 10th, 2021 at 5.37 p.m. I'm calling to order this regular meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School District School Board. And now for information about interpretation for this meeting. Thank you, Board President Ford. I will be giving this announcement with regards to language interpretation in both English and Spanish. Buenas tardes. Voy a dar este anuncio sobre la interpretación en inglés y en español. In, in order to provide language access, we will be providing simultaneous bidirectional interpretation in English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, you do not have to click anything. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language in order to hear the interpretation. If you are using a laptop or desktop, at the bottom right of your screen, you will see a globe icon that says interpretation. Please click on the globe now and select English. If you are using an iPad or a phone, locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation. Then select English and click done. And remember when it's your turn to speak, uh, please remember to be loud and clear and speak at a moderate pace. We are also offering American Sign Language interpretation for this meeting. If you will be using ASL interpretation, please use the Zoom app on your computer, tablet, or phone to join this meeting. If you join this meeting through your web browser, you may not be able to see the ASL interpreter at all times. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea bidireccional en inglés y en español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Si usted no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, verá un icono en la parte inferior de su pantalla a la derecha en forma de globo que dice interpretación. Haga clic ahí ahora y seleccione español. Si está usando un iPad o su teléfono, localice el menú de tres puntos, haga clic en interpretación de idiomas, elija español y finalizar. O si está en inglés, dice done. Y cuando sea su turno de hablar, por favor recuerde hablar con voz fuerte y clara y a un paso moderado. Gracias. Thank you. We may begin. Thank you. And now, Dr. Maldonado, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Absolutely. Please rise and face the flag to my right. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, first of all, no action was taken in closed session, but two items will be voted on during the action agenda section of this meeting. And so now we'll continue with the regular open session agenda. As 2021-22 begins, we find our community battling the COVID-19 Delta variant and following the county mandate for mask wearing indoors. The board is meeting in person and the public may participate through live streaming. We look forward to inviting the public back to our boardroom as soon as we receive the go ahead from the county public health. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you know, we're starting board meetings at 5.30 now, and we have two regularly scheduled reports tonight, COVID-19 at 7 p.m. and the Summer of Learning at 8 p.m. The board will take a 10-minute break at or as close to 7.30 p.m. as re reasonable. And so, Dr. Maldonado, will you continue with your report to the board? Yes, thank you. Greetings, board members, board president Ford, members of the staff and the public, and all of those who are joining us via Zoom. We have been working to finalize plans for the launch of the 21-22 school year. We're so excited to see our students back on campus on Tuesday, August 17th, and hope that everyone has had the opportunity to enjoy their summer. Tonight, you'll be hearing about vaccination rates. We also have our new teachers joining us for an orientation on Wednesday, and we're looking forward to hosting all of our teachers and certificated staff for our annual back to school kickoff on Thursday. High school orientations are taking place this week as well. We are in our final push. We are in our final push to make every student um, to make sure to make sure every student is registered. Please go to our website to start this process or check in with your school site so that your student is able to receive their class schedules and teacher assignments prior to the school year. 
We're also hosting two ribbon cutting ceremonies this week, celebrating the new hands-on learning space at McKinley Elementary School on Wednesday at 3.30 and celebrating the new Santa Barbara Junior High multi-purpose auditorium on Thursday at 2.30. Board members, you have all been invited to attend these events as we recognize the hard work that went into these projects, the generosity of our local voters who supported the bond measures that are also making these spaces possible. Now, I'd like to introduce to you a few talented individuals in our Santa Barbara community this evening. To begin, we have Mateo Dovgen, who attended Adelante Charter School, Santa Barbara Junior High School, and just graduated this year from Santa Barbara High. Mateo's grandmother, Maria Ray, was a longtime and very beloved elementary teacher in our district and an advocate for multilingual education. Mateo has many talents from playing baseball to launching his own salsa making side business. This year, his artwork was chosen for the Old Spanish Diez Days Fiesta that I went to Spanish. Old Spanish Days <laughs> Fiesta poster. And Mateo is here with us via Zoom. Mateo, can you please share with us how that came to be, this poster that you created, and what inspired you to create this beautiful rendition of Santa Barbara? Hi, I was asked by the Presidenta this year, Stephanie Petlow, to design uh, the poster, to graphically design it. So her granddaughter did the artwork and I put it all together, uh, showing uh, each major uh, landmark that we have in Santa Barbara. And we chose the colors and everything made it pop. So uh, I was pretty thankful to be able to have the chance to make the poster this year. And is there anything else you want to tell us about the process or a message that we should take away from all your beautiful art? Um, I don't think so. I just think, uh, you know, if you live in Santa Barbara, you know these special places and how much they mean to the city. And uh, we wanted to capture that in the, in the poster this year. Thank you, Mateo, for being with us and for creating such a beautiful poster. Congratulations. Next board members in public, we have um, the pleasure to recognize another artist in our community. When I saw the beautiful signage at Dos Pueblos High School, I immediately felt that it created the warm, welcoming environment we want to see in all our schools, including the sense of uh, inclusivity, which we know helps send a message to students that they belong to this community and are seen and most importantly valued. John Rochelle is a Dos Pueblos parent whose sons both attended Adams Elementary and La Cumbre Junior High. He is an award-winning graphic artist who has designed iconic logos and fonts from Angry Birds to Black Panther and Daredevil and many other fonts from Marvel Comics. He recently led this very cool project at Dos Pueblos and we asked him to share a little bit about it. Principal Woodard shared that John donated more than 100 hours of his time designing and painting and working with students to make this happen. He is with us tonight, and we're gonna ask him to share a little bit about this project, what led him to do it, and what inspires his work. John, are you with us? I am, hi. Thank you for joining us. So can you tell us a little bit about more about your work, your sure. inspiration? Sure, um, I'm a graphic designer uh, and Santa Barbara, been living in Santa Barbara about 25 years, and my son Dash will be a junior at DP in the fall. And uh, ever since we started at DP, uh, Principal Woodard had talked to me about um, helping to sort of consolidate all of the different logos and colors and fonts and, and uh, different graphic elements that the school was using. He felt that everything was a little all over the place from 50 years of history. And he asked if I could help um, kind of take the best of what was working and, and make uh, more of a consistent style for the school. And so, you know, I started doing a lot of um, designs for him and the first thing that we hit on was the wall signs for the school and uh, and it seemed like something we could start on and work on during the summer and get student help with and I just kind of went big with it um, doing some mock-ups on the computer and I just you know made the letters as big as I possibly could on the school to kind of have as, as much of an impact as we could and add as much color as we could to the to the walls and everybody liked it and they let me keep going <laughs> and uh, uh, who else? Scott Scott Gutentag at the school gave some suggestions for adding background color 
to kind of help the logos pop and also that um, to help when the lo when the schools eventually repainted that they wouldn't have to paint in and around all the details that everything would stay pretty much as it was and that that kind of inspired the 3d shadows and shapes um, that we came up with and I guess the the bilingual was just something I hit on right right off the bat just working with two colors it seemed like well why not have the word up there twice and and provide a translation for kids who don't speak Spanish and as a way to just be more inclusive for the kids that do speak Spanish. Well, that's amazing. We love that you've uh, left your mark, uh, both in the film industry, but also here with uh, Dos Pueblos High School. We appreciate all you've done and, and congratulations. Thank you for being with us tonight. Sure thing, it's been a lot of fun and I look forward to doing more. Thank you. Oh, well, we have more schools. We have 18 more. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll call you. <laughs> Lastly, board members in public, I have a very special treat for you all tonight. This is someone that we all need to be keeping an eye on so we can say, I knew him when. Eliel Pozos Martinez is a sophomore at San Marcos High School and an extremely gifted saxophonist who performs in a variety of places, including outside of his own home or on State Street where crowds gather to hear his incredible music. I had an opportunity to hear him on the 4th of July and was inspired to see how the audience responded to his amazing and beautiful musical talents. I want to thank his mom, who is here with us today, and his sister as well, who are incredibly supportive of his passion. Eliel started playing drums at the age of eight and received his first music lessons at the Santa Barbara Boys and Girls Club, one of our incredible partners. His mother, Gisela Martinez, said that one day he had a spark of passion for the saxophone, and he has loved it ever since. He is a member of the Advanced Jazz Band at San Marcos and is a very, very good student as well. Welcome, Eliel, and please share your talent with us.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Eliel. And board members, I just want to remind us that my, at least my belief is that the arts are an expression of our humanity. And that is the business that we're in with all of our wonderful students, teachers, leaders in our district. And I, I'm very proud to feature so many, so many of our talents like Eliel's. Is there any questions for Eliel while we have him here? Any comments? Oh, please, Mrs. Munoz. Um, thank you so much. Muchas gracias por una hermosa canción y tu talento de sabor a mí. Muchas gracias, impresionante. Thank you so much. Please, Ms. Caps. Yeah, thank you so much. I would love to know why you chose that song. I just, I, it really speaks to me, but I would love to hear. Well, uh, so Kenny G is obviously a really popular saxophone player, mm -hmm. and he released a Latin album like a while ago. And one of the songs on there was Sabor a Mi, and that was a really nice song that a lot of people liked, so I chose just to play it. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Ms. Alvarez? Thank you very much, and congratulations on such an amazing talent. I like to know where you play so I can come and listen to you. And anytime you want to come over to the board meeting, you know where we're at. Thank you. Really, it was a great way to begin the meeting. Um, Mr. Kelly, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I wish we could start every meeting that way. Sorry, I'm close to the mic. Um, also, I'll see you next year at school. Hopefully, we're finally in person. I go to San Marcos as well. So feel free to say hi to me in the halls. <laughs> you. I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Maldonado for making this possible today. I'm really excited to announce that we are going to try to begin every board meeting with something related to the arts. And here we have Eliel, who is the inaugural student performer. So one more time, a nice round of applause for Eliel. Um, I'm sorry, uh, President. Oh, Wendy, please. <laughs> uh, I'm just through the technology. Thank you, Eliana. I'm able to hear your beautiful playing. So thank you again for being here and being the first one as, as to start off as many. So thank you so much. Great. Let's continue on now with the student board report. Mr. Kelly, do you have anything you'd like to share? Uh, not much to report since the last meeting, but uh, I'm excited to go back to school. I went to orientation today. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be continuing communicating with students. And hopefully before the next board meeting, I'll get a group of students together that I can meet with on a biweekly basis. So I can ensure that um, I'm sticking to my promise of equity of education and resources. I think I believe that's the most important thing, especially when it comes to education. This is what provides opportunities for the future. And uh, I cannot represent the whole student body by myself. So getting that group together is um, absolutely necessary. Sounds great. Thank you so much. So now we'll continue with board member comments and correspondence. I'll begin with Ms. Munoz. Uh, thank you, President Ford. I would just like to say that I'm excited and looking forward to the beginning of school. I appreciate all the preparation and hard work that is being done by all in order to ensure that our students and staff are able to begin the new year, the new school year in the safest manner possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Sims Moten, do you have any comments tonight? I do. Thank you, President Ford. I'll make some really brief. Uh, again, thank you for the technology to be able to be there. And I'm really excited for the upcoming school year to hope the students and parents and everybody in the communities uh, ready and ready for us to get back to school. And I'm here in this community here in Texas. I've been uh, looking at the local schools here, even the one that I actually went to, uh, and they're getting ready for school and working really hard, and everybody's really excited uh, to be back. And so it's good to see it here locally and also to be able to bring back that enthusiasm uh, back to Santa Barbara. Excellent. Thank you. Ms. Caps. 
Just to echo how uh, it's fun to drive by schools and see the parking lots full again. And I know a lot of them were already full during summer because we had such a robust summer school, but um, we're excited to get back and come together as a community for our kids. Thanks. Terrific, thank you. And Ms. Alvarez, please. Yes, uh, a big thank you to all the teachers who are spending countless of hours getting their classroom ready and getting ready for back to school. So thank you very much to Mr. Vance and Dr. Maldonado for hosting uh, the Leadership Institute a couple of weeks ago and also the meeting that you had with the office managers. They're such an important component of our district and the work that they do to welcome the families and the students. So thank you so much for doing that. And thank you to all the classified staff for all the work that you were doing to all admin. It takes, it really takes a village to get school going and uh, we're looking forward to seeing the students back and seeing the parents back as well. So thank you and um, I look forward to visiting the schools once they are in session. Absolutely, thank you. Also, I'd like to announce that since our last board meeting in July, the District Leadership Institute took place over the week of July 26th to the 30th. I was lucky enough to be invited to speak to the leaders and moreover to observe what a great group of leaders we have in this district and what a terrific week of learning, sharing, thinking, and planning was experienced by all. And just like the Major League Baseball players each choose a song to walk onto the field to, I challenged everyone to think about what song would be symbolic of their own walk on to the 2021-22 school year. Members of the cabinet chose walk on songs too and it was a way to have a little bit of fun and also reflect on how we are all so very different but our inspiration comes to us in many different ways too. One highlight for me was when we revealed that Dr. Maldonado's choice was the 1975 disco hit, The Hustle. And she led the entire group in dancing The Hustle. A new tradition was born. Uh, many thanks also to the Moxie Museum and the Santa Barbara Educational Foundation for their generosity of the space and the meet and greet reception on Thursday afternoon. And finally, tonight, we celebrate another classified employee who is retiring. Esther Caesar has been with Santa Barbara Unified for over 30 years and is retiring as an administrative secretary in student services. She'll be leaving us on September 1st. I want to thank you, Esther, for all your service, your dedication, your contributions to our students and to our district. We all wish you a happy and healthy retirement, as well as some clearly well-deserved rest and fun. At this time, it is our opportunity for comments from the public about items that are not on the agenda this evening. And all of the public comments tonight will be limited to two minutes each because we have quite a few. And also they were info informed of this um, earlier today. So Ms. Trujillo, do we have any public comments for this particular issue, issues that are not on the agenda? Thank you, President for Members of the board, good evening. Uh, yes, we do have 10 speakers on this item. I will name the first five so they can be getting ready. Um, Danny Blunk, Linda Bonet, Peggy Wilson, Judy Brown, Shelley Trost. And I will begin with Danny Blunk. Hi, uh, I'm here to speak again. And I would like to know when our questions are gonna be answered and also why we have to sit here outside when other people could go in that's not part of the board. That's uh, just my only two questions. I would love and appreciate if we could go inside to find for our kids' rights. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda Linda Bonet, can you, can you hear us? Ms. Trio, could you announce that again? It was a little hard to hear. Yes, Linda Bonet. Ms. Bonet, can you unmute yourself? Oh, 
I'm sorry, we're not able to hear the speaker. It seemed like there was more than one speaker, so I'd like to have the, That's the problem. member of the public that has been called on, and um, hopefully I can hear it better. President Ford, I will uh, come back to Ms. Bonet. I will okay. With our next speaker, which is Peggy Wilson. Ms. Peggy Wilson, can you hear us? Would you please send me yourself, Peggy Wilson? Um, no response, so I will move to our next speaker. Judy Brown. Ms. Judy Brown is not online, so I will go on to our next speaker, which is Shelly Trust. Shelly Trust, can you hear us? Would you please unmute your phone? Thank you. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me now? Yes, go I'm ahead. I'm sorry. I couldn't figure out from my phone how to unmute myself, and I lost the Zoom meeting on my computer. That's okay. um, what was on my mind and doesn't seem to ever be on the agenda anymore is the sex education curriculum that was passed for my grandson's school age in junior high school. Um, with the kids going back to school this fall, I'm very concerned about this curriculum. I think that there are a lot of things in it that are not wholesome and are not family oriented. And so I just would like to know, is that curriculum going to be implemented in this school year? That was my question. Thank you for your time. I will name our five um, more speakers. Alfred Parmalou, Barbara Battistini, Justin Shores, Caroline Abate, and Sheridan Rosenberg. And I will begin with Alfred Parmalou. Hello, can you hear us? Hello? Yes, go ahead. You can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. I'm a Santa Barbara resident and my daughter went through the public school system. Even back when my daughter reached her junior year at the Santa Barbara High School, she asked to leave the public school system. Her reason that she did was that she didn't feel like the environment was conducive to her realizing herself or her education. She held the GPA over 4.0, maybe a 4.3. Did you know that someone could have a higher GPA than 4.0? It was truly amazing. Generally, I'm in support of our schools, the concept and the mission, a place that is safe and supportive where the village and trusted children for part of the day while they, the parents can occupy themselves to maintain a roof over their heads and food on the table. Conceptually and ideally, the schools act as an extension of the family beliefs, supporting the values and the morals of the village. 
helping to socialize the children and at the same time, because of the combined resources, are also able to teach skills and provide basic education. As a consequence, school children become informed, learn skills and feel empowered to move through life, to realize their potential, their wellness and serve the community. This is the desire of any healthy community to support health, wellness for their own and out of the whole. The school board system plays an important role in supporting and maintaining these schools. At this time, I wanna say thank you to all of you for being there, sitting in these seats, created to foster our education system and be supportive. I wanna review what in my perspective is the basic role of the school board of trustees. To me, it is for you to act as overseers to assure that the mission, the objective of the public system, public school system serves the purpose of our community, that the schools never forget their main mission to safeguard the community's children, the future treasures, to oversee Hi. the viability of the school system, making Hi. sure Thank you to serve at the highest level. Thank you. you. As members of the board sitting in those chairs, are you- Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Peggy Wilson. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. I'm, so, I'm so sorry, I had technical problems. Okay, uh, board members, online parents and community. Uh, did you know that Benjamin Rush was a founder, signer of the Declaration of Independence? He was the father of public schools. And he said, teach students to love and serve God, country and family. This board is far from that. I've attended countless meetings with parents and family members objecting to sex ed curriculum, just communities, CRT that teach racism, hate or Marxist and anti-God. This board believes it knows what's best for your student, not the family. This board is now partnered with Planned Parenthood, the largest provider of abortions in the nations that harvest fetal tissue and organs for financial profit. This board is giving Planned Parent access to your student. I've spent several years coming to board meetings, pleading with the board to listen to the parents. I've been angry with the board, but now I'm just appalled at the pride and arrogance of this board. This board is not for excellent education. Look at the grades. The board's sworn duty is to an untried ideology on your students. Parents, it's time to leave government schools. Parents, teach your children to love truth, to seek truth and defend truth. It's time parents to pull your kids out of government schools because you can, because government schools are the worst in the nation, because government schools are morally repugnant and anti-God. And parents, did you know that the universities of Harvard, Yale and Princeton all started as Christian colleges to train ministers, ministers and teach biblical truth? Be inquisitive, parents. Be fearless. Be courageous. They're your children, and they are the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda Bonet. Hi. I'm glad we got this squared away here. That sax player was awesome. Thank you. Parents, grandparents, and interested citizens, please put me down for inoculating every child from pre-K to 12th grade. I implore all parents to inoculate your children with a truth serum. What is the truth? Simply, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. The truth is what we are all taught by Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. It's the content of your character, not the color of your skin. What are the lies? CRT says white children are oppressors and villains. Brown and black children are oppressed and victims. Teach, educate, inoculate your child. Tell them that their teachers are lying to them. Some teachers actually believe it's poison. Others teach it because they're mandated to and they want to keep their jobs. Expose the Marxist, racist indoctrination that lie to our kids. Our children don't belong to the corrupt teachers unions. They are ours and created in the image of God. To Supervisor Maldonado and the school board, you are all taught the truth. MLK's famous words are in our country's DNA for the past 55 years. Somewhere along the line, you knowingly drank the Kool-Aid. You rejected the truth and embraced a ludicrous lie. There is a revolution 
going around across this nation by way of we the people. It's called school choice. It means that each child will get X amount of dollars and the parents decide where the children will go. When there's competitions, parents won't choose this venue or your curriculum for that matter. The, um, let's see. For now, you and the teachers unions have the power. Enjoy it. Have a party. This is the perfect time for you to do your self-congratulatory happy talk you are so good at. Because when the parents take back their power through school choice, you will no longer be needed, no longer be funded, or no longer be employed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Justin Shores. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello. Okay. Um, the, the point of a local board is to, to judge the community's uh, responses and, and to govern locally, not to, not to govern top down from what the federal government. And that's what we saw last week with all the mandates that you guys put into all of the public schools across the nation. This, isn't, this was not you guys talking to your community. This was not looking at the case counts. This was, not, this was not well thought out. This was doing what you're told. Um, the, um, you guys are blindly following your party and that is not helping our kids. Um, I've followed a lot of boards. I went to the OSHA board. I went up to, I, I listened to the CDPH um, and they all blame each other. OSHA even says, there, no one has died from the vaccine. We should all just take it. How is that okay? How is somebody so misinformed making our health decisions? And you guys are just referring back to them. We ask for data. You guys don't provide it. We want the data. We want you to prove all these emergencies. Prove the fact that you could, you're going to put our kids in masks another year. Prove to us why our kids are going to suffer another year with no reason. These kids do not get the virus. If they do, they're, they're, we don't, they're, they're asymptomatic. They're not feeling it. We need to work through this like every other virus. Stop using this for power. Let our kids learn. Start teaching our kids. This, is, this is, needs to stop. And we're not going away. Thank you. Next speaker, Shelly Trust. Mr. Hill, I believe we already had Shelly. Oh, I apologize. Thank you. I think it's Barbara next. She is not online, so okay. I will go. Our next speaker will be Sheridan Rosenberg. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I actually just wanted to um, bring up this Newshawk article that came out August 7th about uh, Santa Barbara Unified School District experiencing a leadership exodus. And I just wanted to address that. First of all, you know, I, I want to be open minded about Hilda. I, I think Carrie Matsuoka was a disaster. And I've always had such high hopes for Hilda. I have to say that the departure of Maria Lyris Horton is a huge step forward. She was abusive, she was toxic, and it's good that she's gone. I can only say to you that the person you replace should be someone who is warm, who listens to families, all families, who brings these families together regardless of their socioeconomic statuses, or ethnic backgrounds, that should be a priority. Thank you for the departure of Maria Larios Horton. I also wanna talk about Todd Rickman, long overdue. Replacing him with Brian Rouse is a huge improvement. The woman who was sexually harassed by him allegedly is a friend of mine, and it was a real trauma for her. Knowing that he's gone is a good thing. I uh, also want to bring up Meg Jete's departure. I was really troubled to read that Meg, who in my opinion 
was warm and competent and conscientious and a loyal, a, a very loyal member of, uh, of the district for 30 years, asked for another six months so she could get her full retirement benefits. And apparently that was denied to her. And you know, Kate, I think I know that you know Meg and respect her. And Hilda, I think you need to change this and revisit it. Fine. That Thank was an unfair you. thing to do to Meg. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barbara Battistini. To our board members, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Good. Back in September of 2020, the Santa Barbara Unified School District Board marched in lockstep with one another to push and adopt the Teen Talk curriculum in spite of over 1,000 voices protesting this perverted and parenthood material. In the Zoom meeting, there were close to 90 people speaking, and, and at the end of the night, you all bowed your heads and cast your vote. I would like you to sit there right now and listen again to another example straight from the book Teen Talk. Talk. Many parents are clueless and would be shocked to know this is what our leaders voted in. Courtney, Lisa and I have been dating for over a year. When we slept together for the first time, I had kissed a few guys before her, but never another woman. Let's just say that kisses from guys left me feeling bored, like there was something missing. It was a school night, but my parents were out of town, so I took the opportunity to stay home at Lisa's house. We went down to the basement and started watching a movie. Neither of us had ever been with another girl before, but she had sex with a guy in the past. I asked her about STDs and all that, and we knew we didn't have to worry about pregnancy. About 15 minutes into the movie, we started making out and decided to move upstairs to her bedroom. I felt nervous, but excited. Lisa began to move quickly, but I stopped her and said, hey, we have all night. Let's take our time. And she agreed. The next morning, I woke up next to her and knew that being a woman with a woman felt right to me. Okay, this, I would like you uh, to uh, understand that this curriculum sexualizes children teaches children to consent to sex, promotes dangerous and anal and oral, oral sex, promotes homosexual and bisexual behaviors, promotes sexual pleasure, promotes solo and mutual masturbation, promotes transgender ideology, and has our children make friends with their provided counselors and teachers, Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood, the largest provider for abortion, is in your back pocket, and it is time this community call this board to accountability. We're asking parents to- Time. Uh, schools. Thank, Thank you. you. President, for that concludes public comment on this item. Mr. Hill, I think we were going to have Carolina Bate. Did she uh, decide not to? She is not online. Uh, she's she is right at the door. Okay. I know. It'll be fine. Do you want to speak into the closest microphone? You want to speak? Speak into the phone. Speak into the phone. Okay. 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 Um, good evening, school board members and members of the public. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. We'll this is not working. I'm sorry. The public can't hear you. Are you not online? Yeah, Sandra. Sandra, is there some way you can help her? Absolutely, she can. Um, I will go outside. One second. No. Excuse me? Just in the interest of time, can we move to the next person? The public won't be able to hear. 
And say my public comment, then you can move on so that your meeting isn't held up. Does just so you know, the public, the public has to hear you. That's okay. That's okay. I'll just speak really loud. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Hill, can yes. you unmute Judy Braun and she'll use that phone? Yes. Judy Brown is not connected um, online unless she's logged in as with a different name. Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, school board members and members of the public. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. We all know how important education is for the future of our students and our country. Tragically, public schools deprive children of their rightful education in many ways. At the worst, our teaching children sexual curriculums, which put dangerous and bizarre ideas into their delicate hearts and minds against which they do not have the mental capacity to defend themselves. Public schools teach racial curriculums that are full of inaccurate American history and plant the seeds of hate and animosity among our students. When children are deprived of their education, it is like putting a curse on them. This is illustrated by the whole coronavirus situation which is so complicated and there is so much to know and understand. This shows exactly why our country must have educated citizens who are taught truly objective science, math, statistics, medicine, cellular biology, data analysis, research, and all of the many aspects that go into understanding the coronavirus situation. The curse of ignorance will haunt and hurt them for the rest of their lives because they are at the mercy of the government to explain things to them, make decisions for them, and tell them what to do. How will they know if they are being told the truth or being deceived and manipulated if they do not have the knowledge base to think for themselves? Until the day when public schools can again become the valuable academic institutions they were originally supposed to be, parents, Please support California school choice ballot measure for November 2022. This will establish education savings accounts and give parents a choice and a chance to take their child out of public school. This will require about a million signatures starting this September to get on the ballot. I'm signature you. gathering will be just like how we were able to recall Gavin Newsom. Thank I'm you so much for your time and your attention. President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you very much, Mr. Hill. We're now going to move on to the consent agenda to approve the items that are considered routine and not likely to uh, require any discussion. Dr. Maldonado and her staff have recommended that the board approves all of the consent agenda items. And we have also had an opportunity to consider and ask questions about these items before tonight. So first, Mr. Hill, are there any public comments on the consent, consent agenda items? President Ford, we have two public comment on um, the consent agenda. Thank you. Barbara Battistini and Sheridan Rosenberg. I will begin with Barbara Battistini. Hi, I'm sorry. Can you please tell me again which one this is? I, I just left the room. This is consent agenda item, memorandum of understanding between Galita uh, Valley Junior High and AHA. Okay, um, I'm here just to say about AHA, you know, Jennifer Freed, we know her background. Um, I don't know how somebody like that can be put in charge of children. Um, I don't know if she's still there, but I can say this. I can say that some of this material in this book, I'm going to read it to you. Um, 
So um, what about what happens? Okay, living day to day. Sorry. So jur journal invitation, living in accordance with the sexual values you hold, support self-respect and deeply influence the choices you make is also affects how you perceive things. Examining your values means understanding why and how. What about an experience you had that forever changed your sexual value you held? Could it be a direct experience, a movie or book? What challenges you face? What challenge do you face when thinking about sharing your sexual beliefs and values with others? How do you feel about reading and writing sexually explicit words? And then on the side, it has virginity, oral sex, masturbation, courtship, birth control, intercourse, ex sexual experimentation, etc. Okay, so we have lots of things here. Each of us have learned from family upbringings and social environments that certain attitudes or opinions about sex and sexuality. We may disagree or agree. Sorting out the messages is helpful in coming to deeply know about our beliefs and attitudes about sex and sexual behavior. Kissing fondly, age of sex ex first experience, how long to wait to have sex, having sex, men and sex, women and sex, birth control, intimacy. Why is a school teaching this? Why do you have young 12 year olds listening to this? This is junior high, I believe it's at junior high. If not, it's at high school. Either way, um, I'm appalled by this. Living today, today, we receive thousands of messages about sex from a look exchange between strangers. Select one or two of the most powerful messages you've received about engaging in foreplay or sexual fondling and write down how you got those messages. Draw a simple picture depicting a struggle on an agreement about what you believe or to be true or script. Time. Thank this you. Next speaker is Sheridan Rosenberg. Good evening. Uh, in June 25th of 2019, I spoke out against the uh, AHA contract, specifically about Jennifer Freed, after I saw a Facebook post that she's since taken down, which she posted June 14th of 2019, posing with Sex with Emily. It was a podcast she just finished doing with this very, it's, it's a, to say it's adult content is an understatement. I brought, Laura will remember, as will others. I know Wendy Sims Moten was there. Uh, Rose Munoz was there. But I made copies of what sex, the Sex with Emily, um, you know, podcast sort of menu and library. And I pointed out, and, and actually I've listened to her podcast. She's done a number of them with this Emily woman. And it's deeply troubling. I invite all of you to explore this for yourselves. What I also did is I talked to my daughter who complained bitterly about the AHA people interloping with the students on campus. It was totally inappropriate. In fact, one of her friends wrote this to her, wanted me to read it to the school board. I'm going to read it to you again. AHA forces students into uncomfortable situations where they're made to spill personal experiences or feelings in front of a classroom with students they might not want to console in. It's all thought to be for bonding and getting to know each other, but students did not once willingly participate and constantly complained about AHA. One upside was that she, the games they played with students, but most students became uncomfortable because it involved touching other students or being put in awkward situations where you're isolated in front of the class. Most of the counselors seem robotic at times and aren't very personable and even get frustrated when the students don't want to participate in it and made jokes about it. That's one thing. And, and I see Wendy nodding her head. Th that was not an isolated incident. I'm, all of you. my daughter's friends. President Ford, that concludes part one. Thank you very much. Okay, back to the consent agenda. Um, before I call for a motion, board members or Dr. Maldonado, are there any items on the consent agenda that require more information, comments, or discussion? Ms. Alvarez? Yes, uh, President Ford, I'd like to recuse myself from the consent agenda as there are uh, several items there that may be perceived as a conflict of interest, so I will recuse myself from this item. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. President Ford, I move to approve the consent agenda. Thank you, Ms. Capps, and a second? I second. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. 
All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 And all uh, is abstentions, please signify by saying aye. Thank you. This consent agenda passes unanimously. That takes us to the action agenda and we'll move on to eight items for our consideration and approval. The first four items are for, uh, no, I'm sorry, now they're down to two items for approvals of three student interdistrict transfers, two interdistrict, one interdistrict transfer, sorry, things changed right before the meeting, and one petition to readmit an expelled student. So first, item number one, I wonder if I uh, may have, uh, I don't think there are any public comments, right, Mr. Ms. Trujillo? That's correct, no public comment. Great, uh, and this item was related to a student and has been discussed in closed session. So may I have a motion to approve item number one, interdistrict transfer appeal for 21-22 school year, ed code 4660046611, one, one, case number 202122-T8. I so move. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. And second. is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Caps. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously. And on to the uh, skipping on to number four, the board um, action for readmission of an expelled student, Ed Code 48918, Case 2019-25. This also is an item that was discussed in closed session, and I wonder if I may have a motion to approve. So moved, Madam President. Thank you so much, Ms. Sims Moten. And how about a second? Second. Ms. Alvarez, great. So all in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously. Moving on to item number five, the approval of the memorandum of understanding between the California Department of Public Health and the Santa Barbara Unified School District for the COVID-19 testing program. I will turn it over to Dr. Wagenick. Oh, we do. Okay, sorry. Um, but we usually do a presentation first. Okay, good. Okay, Dr. Wagenick. Uh, Good evening, President Ford, Superintendent Maldonado, and the board. Um, we have before you tonight the uh, Memorandum of Understanding between the district and the California Department of Public Health to conduct um, large-scale COVID-19 testing during the 2021-22 school year. I will be um, going into more detail about the testing plan in our regularly scheduled uh, 7 p.m. report, uh, but at this time I will ask, uh, I will open it up for any questions you have about the, the MOU itself. I see, none. I see none from any board members. No. Oh, uh, sorry, Ms. Alvarez. Yes. <laughs> Well, number one, thank you for doing that research and for giving us that thorough explanation. I just want to make sure that it is clear that this is at no cost to the district, or is there a cost to the district? There is absolutely zero cost to the district. In fact, in the contract itself, it states that um, CDPH will be responsible for the cost of the Abbott Binax Now tests. Thank you. I see no other further comments, so may I have a motion? Oh, no, I guess we uh, now we have public, public comments. comments. Yes. We have three uh, public comment for this item. Cheryl Trusky, Adrienne Rutlin, Shelley Trust. And I will begin with Cheryl Trusky. Good evening, board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I want to just have you consider one idea that 
Uh, we're only hearing one side of the debate on this issue, and we're ignoring a great deal of information that is available to us. Uh, there's a uh, Viruses are always going to be with us. Uh, this uh, virus has an animal reservoir, and it's why we can't avoid the influenza or the common cold. This uh, virus is uh, being treated differently from other viruses that have the same uh, death rate. So the death rate for influenza is virtually the same as COVID-19. And we don't do any of these measures for uh, the influenza virus. And so I just wish that we were focusing more on healthy uh, treatments and focusing on improving the immune system and having more rational approaches than torturing our children with all these mandates and testing and masks and vaccinations. Vaccinations that don't work, uh, it's been proven quite often that people that are fully vaccinated are getting COVID-19. So I don't understand why we're putting our children at risk unreasonably and irresponsibly. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker. Is Adrian Rutland? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello? Yes, you may begin. In regards to testing, I oppose all student COVID testing. All COVID tests are an emergency use authorization. Kids 0 to 18 have never been in an emergency. It is not a pandemic for that age group. Um, symptomatic transmission has been disproven. There is no need to test that age group to stop a so-called asymptomatic transmission. If a child opts out of testing, what are the consequences for not taking the test? If someone in his class or classes comes down with the COVID virus, what are the procedures? Shut down the school, disinfect the school, quarantine the school for 10 days? I see you are all together. Since since vaccinated can still transmit, did you all take the test before you got together? And why was that option not given to us so that we could be in the room with you, seeing you face to face? Like Alfred said, schools should be an extension of the family and not an extension of government. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Shelly Trust. Could you say that again, Ms. Trujillo? Shelly Trust. Shelly Trust, can you unmute yourself? Hi. Can you hear me? I, my, yes. my computer is not allowing me to unmute. There's something going on with we, the we meeting can itself. You. We can okay. hear you. I just wanted to address um, the shot. Um, I don't agree with the way that society is bullying others in society that are not interested in getting the shot, nor do they want their children to get the shot. It doesn't matter how many times you call it a vaccine. If it has not gone through the proper procedures for a vaccine, it is a shot, much like the flu shot, much like the pneumonia shot. It is supposedly a choice to get the COVID shot. I believe that if you don't want your children to get this shot and they're not interested, I don't get the flu shot every fall. I don't get the pneumonia shot every fall. But yet, if you don't get the COVID shot, all of a sudden, there's something wrong with you. There's something toxic. And the bullying that is going on and now being extended to our kids in the school that they're going to have to get tested every week if they don't have the shot. Kids should only be treated or separated from the rest of the kids if they are sick. And there are many prescription treatments out there that are being withheld from the general public, which is insane, along with wearing the masks all the time. It is such a controlling 
mind bending, oppressive situation that I just want you to reconsider and stop running ravshad over people that are trying to let their voices be heard in society. You vote whatever you want to vote, no matter who comes forward. I'm a parent. I'm a citizen. I live in Santa Barbara. I have children and grandchildren in the school system. Vote I'm no on this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Before that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Hill. And so now that we have heard the comments from Dr. Wagenick and public comments and a couple questions on this item, board members may have a motion to approve item number five, the approval of the memorandum of understanding between the California Department of Public Health and Santa Barbara Unified School District for COVID-19 testing program. I move with enthusiasm this uh, motion. Thank you, Ms. Caps, and a second? I second the motion. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. So all in favor on board members, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand, please. Aye. 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 Oh, this motion passes unanimously. No. On to number six, please. The recognition of Juneteenth as a paid holiday for June 2021. Dr. Becchio, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Maldonado, board members. Dr. Becchio, hold on just a second. Can we have the door closed, please? Please continue. Great, thank you, and good evening, board members. Um, as you are aware, on June 17th, President Biden declared a federal holiday for Juneteenth. And that was a Thursday, which it was the Thursday before the June 18th holiday. Um, this board's um, interest and the superintendent's interest in recognizing Juneteenth 2021. Um, in, in your interest, um, we came together with CSEA to discuss how to compensate employees uh, because we did have 12, 11 and 12 month employees who were on contract that day. Um, the attached agreement is the settlement or the MOU that we reached with CSEA. Uh, the highlights of it are that we have found, we did find some complications around payroll, um, quite a few complications around payroll, um, which kind of led both CSEA and the district in the direction of finding a a day to declare a board holiday in recognition of Juneteenth. So we did find November 24th, which is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. That will actually be a work day for 12 month employees. So if the board were to approve this, we would have a board holiday there recognizing Juneteenth 2021 for 12 month employees. Um, that is not a work day for 11 month employees. And we have about 25 11 month employees. So the solution we came up with was a floater holiday that they could use sometime before, I believe it was before June 1st, um, it stated in the agreement, and that they would have that approved by their supervisor. So those are the, the highlights of, these, of this agreement, and I'm asking for the board to consider this and, and approve this MOU. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Trujillo, are there any public comments on this item? No public comment. Thank you. Then board members, do you have any further questions or comments? Just to express full support for Juneteenth being a paid holiday and I uh, appreciate they were taking a step. Thanks. Ms. Alvarez. And um, thank you, Dr. Bakio. I do appreciate every uh, all, all the complexities that you mentioned, not to mention that it's a different fiscal year. So I, I think this is a great solution. So thank you for bringing that forward. And Ms. sims Moton. Yes, I also want to express my uh, gratitude for recognizing the holiday and recognizing the work, uh, what we need to do to make sure that they, obviously the employees were recognized for their work in that day. So just expressing my gratitude for um, holding this up as a holiday as part of this district. Excellent, thank you. 
Seeing no other, oh, Ms. Munoz. Sorry, um, along with my fellow board members, I would also you know, um, sub have full support for Juneteenth as a paid holiday for our employees. Thanks so much. And Mr. Kelly. Along with other board members, I also express my support. Thanks. And Dr. Becchio, thanks for working this out with the employees. And so now it is time for me to ask for a motion to approve item number six, recognition of Juneteenth as a paid holiday for June 2021. So moved well, with the act, fact that hopefully everybody gets an opportunity to educate themselves about Juneteenth, what it actually means. So I move with the gratitude with this. Outstanding. Thank you. And a second? Ms. Alvarez. I second. Excellent. And so now, all in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously. We're now on to number seven on the action agenda, the approval of amendments to board policy 6158 independent study as required by Assembly Bill 130. Ms. Carey. Welcome. There, there we go. go. Good evening, President Ford, members of the board, Dr. Maldonado. Um, thank you, President Ford, for reading the title of this uh, item because we are bringing to you a board policy that we are required to uh, have you consider and hopefully support tonight. Um, and that is a requirement of Assembly Bill 130. Um, as you can see in the attachment, there is an extensive and technical uh, board policy language that we are already busily implementing. I'd like to just express my appreciation to the staff at Alta Vista for their collaboration in helping us to execute on Assembly Bill 130, uh, which provides independent study as an option for students um, whose health, as determined by the parent, uh, precludes them from participating in in-person instruction this upcoming school year. What I think is the best thing to do is to um, allow you to just ask us any questions you may have, and uh, thanks for your consideration. Well, thanks so much. We um, had lots of things to look over, and I appreciate the all the detail that was given to the board members. Ms. Trujillo, are there any public comments on this item? No public comment. Thank you. Then, board members, do you have any further questions or comments about independent study? Ms. Alvarez. Yes, uh, a, a, one question. So this is the new the new independent study based on a student's health and that they prefer um, instruction away from the classroom. How about the old independent study? Is that still in this policy that we are approving that still remains? So parents still have that um, option in case they're gone for another reason and then they want to come back to the classroom? Yes, yeah, so um, the independent study program as people know it is still in existence um, and this board policy does cover that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from board members? Seeing none, I would like to ask for a motion to approve item number seven, approval of amendments to board policy 6158 independent study as required by assembly bill 130, 130. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. And how about a second? Ms. Caps, thank you very much. Board members, all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carey. And now we're on to number eight, which is the approval of platform renewals for the 2021-22 school year. Shall I turn this over to you, Ms. Lafridge? Can't hear you yet. Good evening. No? Yes. OK. Thank Good you. Good evening, President Ford, board members, Dr. Maldonado. Uh, I am very pleased to bring you a bundled package of our platforms for renewal. Um, and I want to thank our collaboration between the Ed Services Department and the 
Educational Technology Department because we went through and vetted all of the platforms that we use, recognizing that last year, because of the pandemic, we added additional platforms to meet the need. We looked at usage of the platforms. We looked at student outcomes. And the real question we asked ourselves was, what kind of data can we get to inform instruction? And how is this moving the needle for us? And if it wasn't, then we did not bring it uh, to this bundled package. Um, as you know, we are being very conscientious in the contracts that we bring to you for approval. And we wanna make sure that the effectiveness is a result in student outcomes. Um, as such, we were able to save um, about $252,000 or two hundred fifty-five thousand two hundred and forty-two to be exact. Uh, and we are requesting for the bundled package of platforms to be used. We group them for your ease into three different categories. The first is essential to do business. So for example, if we are gonna communicate effectively with families about student grades and keep meaningful grade books and give feedback to students, we need something like Canvas. If we're going to have libraries that can check out books, they need something like Destiny Follett. The next category was those that are part of approved courses or pathways. And I'm very proud of the work that Tiffany Carson did to bring all of the CTE uh, components together into one comprehensive report. And lastly, we looked at um, the last category was acceleration of student learning. So you may have been at a board presentation on something like Lexia, which is used in the elementary schools to promote reading growth, um, has a, a long track record with our district and is individualized based on students' um, performance in that platform. So we looked at student acceleration and how that data could inform instruction. So we also asked our vendors to tell us what reports we could get and generate and how that could help our teachers strategically plan and group. Because if we are putting students on that device, we wanna make sure that we are using that data in a meaningful way so that when they are all together doing in-person learning this year, uh, they can focus on really what strategies and skills and standards we need to hit. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, Brian uh, Rouse is here with me as well. Mr. Hill, are there any public comments? No public comment. Thank you very much. Then we'll go to Ms. Sims Moten. Yes, thank you. I, I am glad to see that there's savings going on. I always love to see that being efficiency with our dollars. I did have a question. If we could be a little bit more specific with regard to the funding sources, do we have specifically where those funding is coming from? And, and the reason that I'm asking that, because if in that funding, in those various um, funding sources, if there's one-time funding, that this is something we need to go ongoing, I'd like to make sure that that's real clear if we might have to fill some gaps because there's some, uh, some one-time funding in those funding sources. Uh, yes, there is a variety of funding sources on the chart that was included in the, the board summary. We list those as either general fund, ESSER, ELO, or if it's a supplemental funding, um, or if it's CTE grants, because some of them are grant funded, but I can certainly follow up with you on any of those funding sources for any of the items. Yeah, I think I just missed the attachment. I was just looking on your background on your staff report. I just seen various there. So it was me, my error in missing that part. So. You're fine. Thanks so much. Any other comments from board members? Ms. Munoz, please. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you um, to Ms. Lothridge, Mr. Rouse, and Ms. Tar Carson for all the effort in terms of how this was presented and organized. First of all, of course, to save so, many, so much money uh, for the district and also to have it so straightforward presented to, the, to us as a board. Thank you. I must agree. I thought it was really well thought out, very detailed and easy to follow. So thank you so much. With that, I'd like to ask for a motion to approve this item number eight, approval of platform renewals for the 21-22 school year. I so move. Oh, thank you, Ms. Munoz. And a second? Ms. Alvarez, thank you so much. So board members, all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 
I, this motion passes unanimously. And just a little early, we're going to be able to move on to our regularly scheduled COVID-19 report. Uh, it's almost 7 p.m. And I will ask Superintendent Maldonado and the Executive Cabinet to proceed with report number 25. It looks like Dr. Wagonick is ready to present. Yes, I am. Thank you um, again, um, President Ford, Dr. Maldonado and the board. I bring to you, and I think there it is, um, COVID board report number 25. Um, next slide, please. So um, these, um, when we first brought the key factors to you in late May, early June, and said these are the things that we're really going to be focusing on, um, in the coming school year, I wasn't quite sure how much we were going to need to do that. And even four or five weeks ago, things looked very, very different. But now as I look at this, every single one of these pieces, these key factors is absolutely essential to our work. Next slide, please. So um, as you can see, from this, uh, this piece of data from Santa Barbara County Public Health, the, the red line there is the rate of cases for unvaccinated individuals. The bottom blue line are our um, vaccinated individuals. Um, as of today, our case rate is 14.3 cases per 100,000. If we were back in the um, old tiered system, we would um, uh, we'd be minimizing our students in school, but we are open. Um, the daily case rate of the unvaccinated is approaching 20 per 100,000. And this is a two week delay in testing. So a reminder or in reporting. So we, this is back on July 30th. Um, but the unvaccinated rate is about five per 100,000. So the unvaccinated COVID rate in our county is approximately four times that the vaccinated rate. And we know from both um, anecdotal and um, quantitative data that those who are vaccinated experience um, a much different version of COVID than many who are unvaccinated experience. Next slide, please. Wanted to bring this back to you. This is the percent of individuals um, who are vaccinated by age in our county. Um, you will see that um, the group that we are most uh, interested in is that 12 to 15, 12 to 18 age group. And when I look to the 12 to 15 group, which is more inclusive of um, our students, we see that at this point, about 37% of students have completed uh, vaccinations and 47% are partially vaccinated, which means they should, um, we should see that number probably closer to that 40% completely vaccinated by our next board meeting is what I would think, hopefully. That's what we're uh, looking for. That rate has um, gone up about 7% from two weeks ago when I last presented uh, the data. Next slide. So um, we have been communicating with families about the importance of vaccination and sharing info about upcoming clinics around town. Um, the number of clinics um, being offered locally has diminished this summer because there was a, a decrease in demand. Those are starting to ramp back up because the demand is going back up. 
We have uh, applied with the California Department of Public Health uh, for pop-up clinics. Uh, we had hoped to be able to provide those prior to the start of school. Uh, uh, CDPH did get back to me yesterday, in fact, and said they want to provide us with those pop-up clinics. They are looking for providers who are available to provide those locally. So when that becomes available, we will offer them. So that's the latest news on that. Next slide, please. So um, a report on our, our own um, vaccination. So the number of teachers who have verified their vaccination or that are fully vaccinated as of today is 70%. Um, teachers do return to work uh, in two days. They'll be back on Thursday. And we've had um, an additional 183 teachers verify their vaccination since August 6th, which was the last board meeting last Thursday. So um, each day we're having more and more people verify. Next slide. So uh, we have had five known staff cases of COVID on site, meaning in district offices or on school sites since July 1st. We did have one transmission that occurred um, on a district site. We've been offering testing to known contacts and exposures. We will continue, obviously, to do that as uh, the school year opens. Um, next slide. So I um, want to go into really the, the meat of the presentation or the report tonight, which is our testing framework. Um, we began looking at our testing framework uh, two or three year, uh, weeks ago and um, reviewed the variety of testing options. What we determined was of, of those four, of the four testing options that were available, what we really wanted to make sure we could do was one, um, prevent outbreaks, and two, help keep our kids in school. We worked so hard last year to get our students in school. We want to keep our students in school. So we, we chose our um, program based on those two aspects, knowing that when we're preventing outbreaks and we're working to keep kids in school, we'll have data that's going to help us keep track of COVID in our schools and district office, um, but we'll also be able to obviously respond to the outbreaks. Um, next slide. So from July 22nd, to July 29th, uh, nearly 72,000 pediatric COVID cases occurred in our nation. So in one week, 72,000 new pediatric cases were reported. That's almost twice as many as were reported the previous week. That, um, that fact um, compels us more to focus on what we're talking about tonight. Pediatric cases in that week accounted for 20% of all COVID cases in our nation. And states such as Louisiana, Florida, Texas, Missouri are experiencing high rates of COVID, pediatric COVID right now. Their hospitals are seeing double digit numbers of pediatric cases. Thankfully, um, our country is not current, our county is not currently experiencing the high rates of COVID, especially the Delta variant that these states are. And the most effective way to never have that experience is to focus on the proven mitigation strategies that we successfully utilized last spring. We need to recognize and I think we have before, but I want to reiterate, we were successful in keeping COVID out of our schools. We had two investigations for possible outbreaks 
and in neither case were there outbreaks in our schools. So we will continue to employ the masking, vaccinations, screening, and the testing of staff that we employed last year. But we're adding an additional layer of mitigation by testing our students. That's going to strengthen our efforts and keep schools open. So at the top of this slide, you see the phrase, helping keep kids in school. Again, as I said earlier, that last year we focused on getting students back to school. This year, our work is to keep kids in school. And we'll do that through the mitigation efforts I spoke of. We invite our entire community to join us in ending this pandemic once and for all. We have chosen to participate in the California Department of Public Health testing program. And tonight, I want to share with you the key aspects of that program. One moment. I'm having a technical difficulties on my notes. All right. Thank you. Um, So let me tell you how that program is going to work. It First, it's our belief that um, based on the current research, and we know that can change, we have to stay nimble. And that's, that's what we've learned with COVID. But at this point, we believe that only unvaccinated students and staff should be part of our regular testing program. However, we do feel that it's important to do baseline testing of all students and staff so that our so our plan is to test uh, approximately 12,500 students and 2,000 staff in the first two to three weeks of the school year in addition to obviously providing support to those who test positive and we hope that number is low we'll use the data from this baseline testing to identify rates of COVID so we'll use that data from that baseline test to see, you know, where are our positive tests? Are they amongst the vaccinated or the unvaccinated? We will look at age groups. We will look at adults versus students. We'll look at ethnicity and other demographics to make decisions um, about our testing plan going forward. Um, second, both students and staff will conduct anterior self swabs in just about the first inch of both nostrils. In just a few minutes, you're going to see a video of six-year-olds conducting their own self-swabs. I know and I can understand for parents that without the information on this, it's um, all sorts of images can come up in the head. So we really want to reassure folks of what this is. In June, I had to have a COVID test like I've never had, and I've had many. Uh, that The one that went way up in, into the, I felt like it was in my sinus cavity. This is nowhere near that. So we want to reassure folks that even um, our six-year-olds will be able to do this. Um, next, we're opting to use antigen testing, um, what is commonly known as rapid testing. Um, that'll be our primary mode. Antigen tests are less sensitive than molecular or PCR tests and may not detect infections in asymptomatic individuals. However, antigen tests are likely to detect, detect those who are the most infectious. So, um, importantly, the Binax Now antigen test, which is one, the test we have already used, on 3,000 athletes, uh, with 3,000 athletes last spring. Um, they're performed at the school site, and the results are available within 15 to 20 minutes. And for antigen testing to be most effective, um, testing should occur more frequently than molecular or uh, PCR testing. Um, so with the faster turnaround time for the antigen tests, um, we can limit transmission by more rapidly identifying infectious 
persons on campus. Um, so in cases where the antigen test will reveals a positive case, we will follow up by using that PCR molecular test. Um, it is highly sensitive. It's unlikely to be falsely negative, And it's very specific, which means it's unlikely to be falsely positive. Molecular testing needs to be performed in specialized laboratories. And because of that, the results generally come back in one to two days. So we will use PCR reflex when we have a positive case. But most of the testing, the vast majority, will be the antigen rapid test. And finally, um, just as is the case with other medical procedures, students, parents, or guardians must give consent for this testing to take place. For families who do not want to consent to testing, the district um, will be giving them the option of independent study through Alta Vista. And finally, one thing that I'm very impressed with, and this is a change, is that parents or guardians will receive the results um, from primary.health of their student's test that same day. So while we will be calling parents immediately if there is a positive test or alerting staff members that there's a positive test, parents will also um, be notified whether, regardless of whether it's negative or positive. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I told you about the um, self-test, the antigen self-test. This is a video provided by the California Department of Health. This is actually was filmed. Um, this little girl is the daughter of one of the nurses from California Department of Health. And it was filmed in her, I believe, kindergarten class. So um, if you'll go ahead and show the video. While they're getting this queued up, um, what I appreciate about this video, because it is filmed intended to show to students, we're planning to create our own, both in English and Spanish, that are similar. But it really does, as you will hear and see, use very child-friendly terms, uh, things that they uh, are able to understand at a young age. Can I have an update on what's happening with technology? OK, thank you. We can also continue. Uh, yeah, we can continue and come back to that. Let's go to the next slide, and then we'll yeah. come back. Oh, oh there we go. OK. <laughs> What are we doing? OK, next. Streets an anterior nasal swab test and was made to help instruct students to do this test on their own to self swab. To protect myself, the protective equipment or PPE I need are gloves, optional but recommended eye protection, such as goggles or face shield and a mask. <laughs> Start by standing at least six feet apart from the other students. The teacher is going to help you wash your hands before you do the test or give you some hand sanitizer. First, we are going to hand you the swab. You're going to want to take the stick and be careful not to touch it with anything. You don't want to touch the soft part of the swab. That part needs to stay clean. You're going to hold it and wait for instructions. And then when we say so and we are far enough away from you, we are going to have you take down your mask beneath your nose. You're going to take your swab and put it in the front part of your nose like you're picking your nose. We are trying to take a sample of your snot. 
you want to both twirl the swab around as well as move the swab in a circle around in your nose, gently touching all sides of the inside of your nose at least four times. We are going to do this for a total of 15 seconds. So let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Then we will take it out and put it in the other side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Then take your swab out and hold it without touching the soft part. Put your mask back on over your nose and wait patiently for one of the adults to take it and run the test. So that was the, uh, an example. So I hope that uh, helps uh, both the board and parents and staff out there see what's to be expected. Parents will know which days their students are being tested on. We'll be on a regular schedule. And I think especially with younger ones or even um, older kids who um, need some preparation ahead of time, um, parents will be able to have that conversation. Remember, you're having, uh, you're, you're doing your test today. So, um, and they can talk through that ahead of time if they like. So next slide, please. Could, could you stay back on that time frame and go over the timeline? That's what I plan to be on this one. Sorry, uh, I didn't see that we had gone on. So complete the application and attend a webinar. These are the steps for completing um, the process for launching the test program. Uh, we have completed our application and I attended the webinar last week. Um, we completed the MOU yesterday, but it's actually officially passed by the board tonight. So we are moving forward with that. They allowed us, um, once we let them know that the MOU was being brought to the board to order our training kits and tests. So those were ordered yesterday. Once we receive approval from CDPH, which should be uh, in the next two days, we can begin training of site personnel. And there will be teams of three to five individuals on each site who are um, trained to uh, conduct the test. So while the students and staff do their own self swab, personnel are needed to complete the other parts of the test um, and um, read them and, and make sure that they are safe. And we are shooting to begin testing the week of August 23rd. That is our goal. Um, that's a lofty goal, but it's one that we need to meet. So we are working feverishly to make that happen. Uh, next slide, please. And at this point, um, another layer of mitigation that is still important, and I think important at all times, is cleaning and disinfecting. I will turn the slide deck over to Mr. Vizzolini. Good evening, board members, uh, Superintendent Maldonado, and members of the public. Uh, as a reminder, we are continuing to follow the California Department of Public Health guidelines for cleaning and disinfecting. Uh, currently, under normal conditions, we use standard cleaning products and standard cleaning methods, um, wiping down surfaces daily and hitting those high touch areas like we always had. In the case of a, in a, the instance of a positive case, um, we have our protocols in place. We have, we'll, excuse me, we'll evacuate the room. Our properly trained and equipped custodial staff will disinfect the area. Um, we have a 30 minute contact time to ensure that our peroxide based chemical does its job. Um, we have signage that we install on the doors of the space so that uh, uninformed people will not walk into the space. They'll be able to be identified that there's disinfecting going on. Um, and then when the room is cleared for use, um, we have a process to notify the site administrator um, that the room is available. Next slide, please. Uh, ventilation continues to be a very important part of our defense against COVID. 
Um, as we know from the testing that we performed, um, our rooms are performing outstanding for almost all of our schools. So we continue to keep our doors and windows open. We continue to have fans running in classrooms, which provided um, as the one you see in the picture. Our HVAC systems continue to run with the fans running continuously during the school day. Uh, and the air filters inside of those units are changed on a quarterly basis um, and more often as needed. Next slide, please. Uh, just a last reminder of some safety measures that are still in place. Um, we still have hand wash stations. Um, we are just uh, getting ready to rent and deliver some more um, that were taken back over the summer. So we didn't incur that cost all summer long, but those are being returned uh, by the end of the week. So they will be there for the beginning of school. We still have our sanit hand sanitizer dispensers and wipes located all over um, the district in classrooms and restrooms and office spaces. And we have plenty of backup material for um, refills of those items. Um, our bottle filling stations are um, continuing to be important. We've installed an additional 20 uh, over the summer and we purchased many more. Um, we have a, a schedule that we're rolling out and we're trying to get those out as much as possible. One of the uh, steps we took is to purchase a different type of bottle filler that is easier to install. So we pay a little more on the front end, but we don't incur the same installation costs, but we're able to get them installed quicker. So in places where it's challenging to install the typical one that you see in the lower right corner, uh, we'll be able to put a freestanding unit that'll go in in a couple of days instead of a couple of weeks. So we're excited about that. Uh, we still have our plexiglass partitions that were, in, that were uh, constructed and placed in public areas. So all of our desks and those types of areas are still there. And of course, we still have extra masks available. So uh, we're in pretty good shape with all of our products. We have backup for our disinfectant. We have all of our gear still at all of our schools so that if we do get a positive case, we aren't gonna have to go out and find things to get it done. It's all at the school sites. The custodians are all continuing to stay trained and we feel like we're in a pretty good spot. Um, with that, I would like to give it back to Dr. Wagoneff if she has any uh, closing states, statements, excuse me. Uh, my closing statement on this would be that you know, I, I, my entire life, have heard my parents um, share stories of being children during World War II, um, ration books, um, and little sacrifices that they had to make as children. But, but they don't talk about the fact it wasn't, they don't talk about the trauma. They talk about how they were able to contribute to the effort. And what I really think about here is our, our children can do this. They can contribute to the effort. And it's not just about them contributing to the effort, it's about all of us contributing to the effort, but it's also about keeping them safe. And as we said, keeping our kids in school. So with that, I wanna let the board that I appreciate the efforts that you're making uh, every day to keep our kids in school. And I invite the rest of the community to work with us to keep our kids in school. Thank you, and at this point, I'll turn it back over to uh, President Ford. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Wagonick. That was a great example. And I, I feel so strongly uh, how much uh, we are grateful to you for sticking with this and pushing on and pushing forward. It, I honestly believe that nothing could be more important. So thank you so much. Ms. Trujillo, do we have any public comments on this report item? Thank you, President Ford. We do have 21 public comments on this item. I will start naming the first five. Douglas McKenzie, Sybil Gilbertson, Danny Blunk, Shelley Trust, Elizabeth Pache, and I will begin with Douglas McKenzie. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go yes. ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Doug McKenzie. I'm a, I'm a physician and surgeon in Santa Barbara. It's time to realize, like some countries are, that SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, COVID is endemic. We're not going to get to zero COVID ever. We can't make it disappear with a vaccine, especially one that might improve symptoms, but as we're seeing, will not stop reinfection or transmission. And despite the hype from politicians in the media, 
Public health officials and physicians should have known this from the conclusions of the original studies. As far as variants know, it's not the unvaccinated's fault. It's the nature of a respiratory virus and the limitations of these vaccines. They actually risk creating more virulent escape mutations. Think about overprescribing of antibiotics and the emergence of resistant bacteria. It's the same concept. More worrisome than the virus, which has barely budged all cause mortality, is the lack of consideration of the profound economic and psychological costs of unscientific, often fanatical policies, as we just saw, unnecessary overtesting now being implemented for children, vaccination in younger and younger people where the harms from the vaccine far outweigh the harms of the disease, the obsession for masking. I see kids outside playing sports wearing masks. It's absurd. There's no science or logic to support that. I worry about society's descent into a mass psychosis, trying to reach an impossible goal of eradicating COVID. Brace yourself for ever more cycles of fear and confusion as the next variant arises and the vilification of people unwilling to subject themselves to coerced vaccinations acts, um, uh, acts are more hateful. This can't end well unless more people wake up. Fortunately, as we see from the massive protests in the UK and France, the burning of vaccine passports in Italy, the vindication of ivermectin as a safe and effective treatment, people are waking up. Thank you. I'm, thank you. Our next speaker is Sybil Gilbertson. Could you repeat yourself, please, Ms. Trujillo? Sybil Gilbertson. Can you please send Hello. me? There you Hello. Go. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, my name is Hi, my name is Sybil Gilbertson. Um, I have a long time uh, background in Santa Barbara as a dancer and an artist. I'm currently working as an associate marriage and family therapist. I have two uh, young sons in the school district, and I want to speak tonight to the ideas of modeling and boundaries as we try to stand up for our children and teach them about informed consent, choice, listening to their inner guidance, their intuition, their deeper sense of knowing what is right for them. The boundaries stop and begin at their own bodies. As much as we are all part of the collective, we are also individuals and must have the right moving forward in a wise world to know what our inner guidance is telling us. I'll just close. That's all I want to say. Well, there's so much more. Um, and, and I want to just echo the person before me who spoke about the ongoing confusion that is bringing about to these children during these times. Um, we are all familiar with the gesture of two hands being put together. Um, the prayer. Um, I want to just kind of point out that in the thousands and thousands of year old yoga sutras, that this mudra or gesture all over the world for eternity is about unity and coming together. That one hand is about the individual and one hand is about the collective and they are not mutually exclusive. They must work together. We must have choice. We must model and teach our children to have a sense of their own deeper knowing and intuition if we want children who will support the world as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Danny Blanc. Hello. Hi. I first want to say this is infuriating. I'm a mother and I'm super angry right now. I have my son texting me, Mom, can I go to school? I say, No, you're not going to be discriminated and you're not going to have a medical procedure every week so you can study. And I also want to remind you, you are not a doctor, a scientist, and you may, your main goal should be provide education for the kids. How about improve our educating your kids and then let the medical decisions to their parents? See, a lot of information being this label misinformation. I will talk about the law. First, coercion is not consent. Mandates, mandates are against the law. It is violation of the Nuremberg Code violation of AMA, medical ethics, and basic human rights. The Health and Safety Code number 24172 says, experiment subject this bill of rights. Be given the opportunity to decide to consent or not to consent. 
to a medical experiment without the intervention of any element of, of force, fraud, deceit, duress, coercion, or undue influence on the subject's decision. Testing, it is a medical experiment. I believe these kids will be tested under duress. I also want to challenge you to prove me that COVID vaccine is safe. How about you show us the ingredients in the vaccine and the facts that make those ingredients safe? You can prove that vaccine is effective when even the CDC is admitting that the areas with the most vaccination rates are also the most affected by COVID. By the way, the CDC is not an independent agency. It is a vaccine company. The CDC owes over 20 vaccine patents. It sells about $4.6 billion of vaccines every year, says Robert Kennedy Jr. Again, this is not about kids' health, but about money. I want to read some facts for you. So later on, you cannot say you did not know. There is no isolated certified reference materials for COVID-19. FDA admits. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shelly Trust. Ms. Shelly Trust, can you unmute yourself? One moment. Ms. Shelley Trust, can you, can you hear us? I will come back to her. Um, I will go on to the next uh, speaker, Elizabeth Fiche. And she does not appear to be online. So I will call on the next five speakers. I will come back to them. Alexandra Carswell, Kimberly West, Alfred Pomerleau, Barbara Battistini, and Sky Byron. And I will begin with Alexandra Carswell. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to say I'm a medical provider in Santa Barbara, and I'm against the mandate of any medical procedure. The guidelines that I recently received for the 21-22 Santa Barbara school year put forth by the district do not seem to make any sense because even the CDC and the WHO have come out to say that getting shots does not stop someone from getting or transmitting the clinical syndrome known as COVID-19 and hence does not confer protection to others. And in your guidelines, I see the main point being protecting the vulnerable and those that are not yet eligible for these shots. Even a WHO official said that people cannot feel safe just because they have had two doses. They still need to protect themselves. So why are we pretending that these shots are the be all and end all and that we are celebrating the rates of people that are getting these shots when this is not the answer for our kids to move forward in a safe way and it's not the answer for our communities to overcome this COVID-19 situation, as our previous physician has already said. So why would you say that your strategies are aimed at protecting those that have not had the shot or are ineligible for the shot when the shot does not confer that kind of protection? Why would you also require kids and staff to test weekly if they have no symptoms? Our governmental institutions have already conceded that PCR testing is inaccurate in detecting active infections. So why does that help anyone? It'll only isolate and shame those that choose not to get the shots and disrupt our children's ability to access their education. The CDC has already announced that they're phasing out PCR testing. They're gonna withdraw the PCR's emergency use authorization December 31st of 2021. So why are we using it now when our governmental institutions are saying it is ineffective? And for- Fine. Thank you. 
Next speaker is Kim West. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you may begin. Uh, I just want to make sure that I've got four minutes here. Sandra was supposed to combine my time. I'm sorry, there are only two minutes on this. Uh, that's not, no, uh, okay. <laughs> you, you guys blew it all, all, again on that, I guess. The fact that you won't open your chambers so that we can at least come inside and talk to you in person shows really poor communication on your part. I was going to use this time to tell my story of distance learning over the last year and a half. I was going to tell you about how my kids, nine and six, have had to go back and forth from their mom's house to my house, carrying a school desk worth of stuff back and forth every two days, two different teaching styles, two different learning environments, two different levels of internet service. And then I thought about speaking to you on all the data on masks and how harmful they are to our kids, but I've decided to take a different approach. I want to remind you who you work for. You work for us, the people, the people. Those chambers that you kept us out of tonight, they're paid for by us, the people. Your job in this situation is to be a child education professional and do right by our kids. So why are all these people lined up out here to speak to you about just that, doing right by our kids? I also want to bring to your attention that the COVID-19 information on the district website is horribly outdated. Your COVID safety plan was updated April of 2021, and the school guidance checklist is from January 2021. Whose job is that? I called about that in July, and clearly the woman I spoke to hung up the phone and went back to filing her nails. There's been a lot of new data since January and April of 2021, and more doses of the cure have been administrated. And more importantly, time has shown us all exactly what to fear concerning this virus. The thing I fear the most is government. As far as I can tell, government is the virus. Do any of you have kids? If so, do you like masking your kids? Do you honestly believe that a cloth mask is protecting our kids? Do you honestly believe that a cloth mask is protecting you? Why do you, you see the need to fight these health orders that are not based in science? I want my kids to go to school in person. I really do. But I'm against the idea of sending them in masks. And part of the reason we send our kids to school is for the social education. Masks have gone, masks have had an effect on the social environment and on adults. Time. How do you think it's a, no, I, I was promised four minutes. I emailed back and forth with Sandra six times today. And Sorry. Our next speaker is Alfred Pommerler. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. So this is directed to Dr. Wagonet or Wagonet. In response to your report on COVID-19, do you know that the CDC is discontinuing the use of PCR as, as the previous speaker talked about? Because the, the, CP, the PCR does not detect SARS coronavirus in someone's system. If you don't know that, you're not doing your research and should not have the position you're holding. With all due respect, it seems to me that you really don't understand what a PCR test is and how it works. It reads a segment of messenger RNA and not necessarily the coronavirus. It will read any segment and is mostly adjusted to such a level that it will look through trillions of samples. Ultimately, it finds something. It does not read the presence of corona. The PCR inventor himself said that it should never be used to diagnose. Antigen testing from saliva does not identify the type of infection people have. It only measures elevated levels of antigens and cannot tell you the causative factor. It, it is not a reliable test. Why would you report with unreliable, most false statistics to people based on erroneous testing procedures? Would a, a testing procedure that has now been rejected by the CDC is an inaccurate? What is your purpose for doing this? Do you know that the virus has never been cultured as a true causative factor of disease or death in anyone supposedly infected? Why do you make children stick swabs into their noses? This is a violation. Immunity actually depends on us making physical contact with each other, breathing and sharing each other's air. You need to renew, you need to review everything you are presenting. I'm happy to come to your meetings and to your schools and teach this. Why keep kids in school when you imprison them by masks, by lockdowns? What you are not knowledgeable and really should be putting into it energy into is what consists of good immunity. How do humans stay healthy? It is through good food, 
good lifestyle, etc. Time. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Sky Byron. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I'm the mother of two young boys and I speak today for them and for all the children of Santa Barbara who wish to be educated without being coerced into taking a medical product. The latest VAERS reports released by the CDC shows over 545,000 adverse events from all age groups following COVID shots including 12,366 deaths and over 70,000 serious injuries. This is between December 14th, 2020 and July 30th, 2021. While a VAERS report does not prove causation, if any other drug or medical product had been associated with this many reports of injuries and deaths, it would have been pulled from the market immediately. From the VAERS data, we already know these shots are not safe. In seven months of COVID shots, there are double the reported adverse events than from all other vaccines combined for the past 30 years. These reports are not just hundreds of thousands of coincidences. I challenge you to spend just one hour reading VAERS reports on COVID shot injuries and deaths and see if you think they seem like coincidences. Whether the shots are effective or not is completely irrelevant because even if they were 100% effective at preventing infection, transmission and death, based on the VAERS data, which is known to be grossly underreported, they are the most dangerous shots ever released to the public and without question their use should be immediately discontinued worldwide. The idea of mandating such unsafe medical products for children who, according to the CDC, have a 99.998% chance of surviving a COVID diagnosis in order for them to be educated is horrifying. There is no medical justification for mandating these shots. You risk harming and even killing the children you are charged to protect. Thank you. Thank you. Our next five speakers are Kevin McKemmy. Juliet Biscoff, Janet Price, Danny Blunk, David Madigan, and I will begin with Kevin McKimmy. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right. Hello. Um, as we enter a new school year, we all are faced with choices, including the choice of vaccinations for our youth or weekly COVID testing. As our scientific community learns more about these vaccines, we understand that they are not the sole cure that we have been led to believe. Breakthrough cases, virus mutations, and record-breaking adverse reactions are proving the shortcomings of the current COVID vaccination program. Case in point, a biodistribution study of the Pfizer vaccine released earlier this summer. Unlike other vaccines, this vaccine does not stay localized at the injection site, but rather enters the bloodstream, allowing the spike protein element to flow freely through the body and into the organs. In this study, scientists reported significant accumulation of the spike protein in the liver, spleen, bone marrow, and shockingly high concentrations in the ovaries. We and our scientific community currently have no way of predicting whether or not this free-flowing injectable spike protein will have long-term effects on our population. Adding to the concern through extensive studying of COVID-19, scientists have discovered that the spike protein is, in fact, a vascular toxin itself, known to be the cause of clots and other cardiovascular diseases and vascular complications. It's imperative to understand that our scientific leaders have acknowledged that this vaccine was never intended to stop the infection of SARS-CoV-2. It was designed to reduce the complications and symptoms of COVID-19. These, the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. Essentially, this vaccine does not stop transmission, and even if fully vaccinated, our children are still as likely to spread it as any an asymptomatic case previously. With this information, I implore you, our leadership, to abandon a deliberately divisive and segregationist approach by exclusively testing the unvaccinated children. If executed, this policy will not help stopping the spread, but it will foster division among our children, encouraging individuals to shame, ridicule, embarrass, and even Amen. bully each other for being different. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Juliet Bischoff. Am I unmuted? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, members of the Santa Barbara Unified School Board for listening to me. I'm a local resident of Santa Barbara High School and UCSB. I'm here to discuss the policy of pushing the COVID-19 shots on our school children. For science to advance, it needs to review all the data as it comes in. We need to ask why data from top flight doctors and virologists is being suppressed on most social media platforms. This is not science, it's censorship. It has no place here in America. Here we celebrate the freedom to choose for ourselves and for our own bodies. These are violations of Nuremberg codes and many other ethics to push this shot. Adults are at the age of consent, children are not. The CDC shows that children 17 and under only account for 0. 0.0057 of deaths from COVID. The pharmaceutical companies require a COVID release that exonerates them from all damages. The warnings now include serious heart issues. Many doctors and experts worldwide agree that there are other effective treatments like ivermectin for COVID other than these shots. Why in the world would we want to take a risk with our children with vaccines, which even a few years ago would have been banned for their high injury and death rates. I am not anti-safe vaccine, but now it's personal. Besides my two girlfriends suffering from racing heartbeats of over 180 and massive fatigue, my own mother was paralyzed for six hours, unable to blink, speak, or move. And then my cousin, my namesake, a graduate of San Ynez High School who earned a teaching degree, was talked into getting the COVID shot she didn't want. I'm she received the shot and she died I'm last night. Thank you. Please don't put Next speaker is Janet Price. Hi, good evening. Thank you for um, letting us speak tonight. I'm a retired teacher and I, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. I felt compelled to speak on the mask and vaccine mandates for students and teachers. Um, I'm really impressed by the program you have uh, uh, put up to mitigate and take care of COVID in the schools. Thank you for all your hard work for that. But I am concerned about masks for children, especially young children, because it's just not healthy for them. Psychologists say that because they are still developing communication skills, mask wearing means that they cannot see nor easily use facial expressions with each other, which are a huge part of nonverbal communications. They're not also healthy, uh, especially for young children who don't always wear the mask properly, who touch their face and fiddle with them all day long. Masks worn by six children in Gainesville, Florida were sent to a lab for a culture. Five masks had bacteria, parasites, and fungi. Three had dangerous pathogens uh, and pneumonia causing bacteria. They also found TB, meningitis, sepsis, and bloodstream infections on these masks. Ew. <laughs> you know? So um, I just read an article that cites 47 studies from the US and other countries that show masks don't protect against COVID-19. This virus is so small that it easily penetrates masks. N95 masks work best, but by no means are 100%. Medical masks are negligible and cloth is no protection at all. More important is the air quality of the building. And I'm glad to see that you guys are addressing this matter in the classrooms. Thank you. I just wonder about students with asthma and other respiratory issues for whom wearing masks is extra unhealthy. Masks are harmful to children and they don't work and we shouldn't mandate them. Also vaccines, I'm not against vaccines, but mandating vaccines that are not yet approved by the FDA and which are injections involving experimental mRNA is not only irresponsible, but reminds me of totalitarian governments of the past. Uh, CDC and VIRS numbers of- Time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Madayang. David Marianne is not on 
line. I will call on the next five speakers. Justin West, Lisa Ostendorf, Amy Smith, Justin Shores, Maria Kastner, and B. Sanders. I will begin with Justin West. C school board, C school board. Four, minutes four minutes is four minutes. I'm gonna get my four minutes. <laughs> Mr. Hilo, thank you so much for emailing me all day long to set up my four minutes. So you guys, the bottom line is, schools where our kids go to create their futures, both in an educational sense and in a social sense, they become themselves in school. That's their little chance as kids to live an independent life and to start to establish decision-making skills to make friends, to play sports, to get into relationships. For some kids, school's the only normal place they have. Why in the world have you taken that from them? Why in the world do you wanna compromise that experience for them by, by forcing them to wear a muzzle? And please don't say because of science. Now that concludes my written statement. And I just wanna say based on the, the COVID information that was given to us at the beginning of this agenda item, it really seems as though the school board watches too much CNN I literally heard all of those talking points on CNN this morning. It makes me sick. You guys need to get, get it together. Let our kids go to school. Let our kids pursue normal lives because this is not normal. What you're doing is not normal. You guys are supposed to be education professionals. This is not normal. This is not normal for our kids. Admit that. When you sleep tonight, I want you to hear my voice. This is not normal. This is not normal. Shame on you, school district. Shame on you. When, my, when your head hits the pillow tonight, think of my voice. Parents, parents listening at home, I implore you, hold your kids back from school the first two weeks. We must protest these measures. Parents listening at home, do not send your kids to school. Do not send your kids to school. Shame on you, school board hear my voice tonight when you go Hi. to bed. Shame on you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lisa Ostendorf. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay, good evening. I am extremely concerned about the COVID vaccine mandates just passed for teachers in the school district. Do I need to remind the board about what happened 80 years ago in Nazi Germany? What happened was the government wanted to exterminate a certain group of people and any other government dissidents that did not agree with its narrative. People were separated by their status and were marked with a yellow star. These people were segregated and discriminated against by not only the government, but the rest of the population. You know the rest of the story. Do you really wanna set up a two class system with, within the teachers union? Do you want the, only the unvaccinated to be separated out and forced to take unproven tests and wear dangerous masks and cause bias and discrimination in your ranks? Do you really think this is the purview of the school board to intervene in and recommend experimental medical treatments when you are not doctors? Your jobs as board members are to make our schools a great learning environment for our children and to keep private medical choices and personal politics out of the classroom. We will not stand for elected officials breaching, breaching the God-given and constitutional rights to, um, to bodily integrity and freedom of choice. And don't tell me that you can choose another school to go to when my tax dollars are, as an American citizen, are paying your salaries. If you do not reverse your stances on forced masking, tests, and, quote, vaccinations of teachers and children, you are asking to be voted out or recalled by the people. My children were both damaged by vaccines that they, quote, needed to attend your schools. And we will not stand for more abuse heaped onto our most valuable assets, our future generation. Do the right thing and reverse any and all COVID mandates. I'm Thank you. Thank you.
Our next speaker is Amy Smith. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Um, I'd just like to point out that I, I am a doctor. I have a PhD in material science and I've worked in, um, in quality control. So I have uh, experience looking at data and understanding and analyzing data. And I worked under a statistician, which was a great opportunity, but I'm very concerned about the way da data is being cherry picked to mislead and create a climate of fear. This, according to a world-class epidemiologist at Stanford, John Ioannidis, I can't pronounce his name very well, but he is a world-class epidemiologist. He, he very early on said that this rises to the level of a, a, a bad flu and not 1919 flu, but a bad typical flu year, in like in recent times. And we're doing all of these extreme measures. And if you look at the, the graph, unfortunately, we, we don't have the update to date graph was not published, the one that was used in the presentation, but it has data be looking at the vaccinated and the unvaccinated starting on um, May 15th and going through July 19th. And it's showing a much lower rate of cases in the vaccinated. But are you aware that on May 1st, the CDC changed how it recorded cases? If you have a positive PCR test and you are not vaccinated, you get counted as a case. If you have a positive PCR test and, and you're vaccinated, you don't get counted as a case unless you're actually hospitalized or die. So that is called fraud, my friends. That is not honest science. So this data, this charts in front of you that look very scary with the unvaccinated looking like the danger people is fraudulent and dishonest. Now you wanna institute mass testing with something that was quantified by the, the PCR test. So it's not as good as the PCR test and the PCR test is being phased out because it was never accurate. It always had a false positive rate. The cycle threshold that was used to, to quantify and characterize the test you plan to use this year. Time, Time. thank you. Next speaker is Justin Shores. Hi, thank you, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, the Santa Barbara uh, Unified School Board continues to ignore public input and they make their own biased ideological decisions no matter what the cost to education. They allow teachers and staff to come to board, board meetings and to berate parents and cheer their biased decisions. And then they even thank them by name. The COVID restrictions have allowed them to keep parents away from the table. They will keep it like this as long as possible. They now have the tool of labeling any dissent as misinformation and ignore facts, even from the CDC and others, if it goes against their ideology. The Santa Barbara public school system is neglecting and abusing our children with their political agenda. They have created a problem by not allowing our children to come on campus, even though other local schools did. And now they wanna use the mental health crisis they created to push students and staff into experimental treatments. They ignore science and when asked to provide data, they, they have no data to support it. Multiple board members are pledged to a political party and they have traded their voice for power. They do whatever their party tells them to. We saw that the biggest way possible last week with the sweeping mandates coming from all the local boards. This coordinated attack was a power grab and a push by the federal government to break the will of people with dissenting opinions. I hope everyone can enthusiastically help recall this school board. We are done. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barbara Battistini. Ms. Battistini, can you unmute yourself? Hi. Hi, this is, yeah, thank you. I just want to say, um, putting masks on children that aren't even susceptible for getting sick is tyranny. And you're putting children in lockstep 
and preparing them for something else. This is an agenda and we are here to say, we the people do not want this for our kids. You don't listen to us, you haven't listened to us. We've been down this road before, but we are gonna fight because we will fight for children and their innocence. They do not belong to be masked. They do not belong to have to go through testing. Um, this is so unnecessary. And I think the whole world's watching right now. And there are, there are 110,000 um, doctors that are speaking about this and it is becoming world knowledge. So get with the program and stop trying to take our children away from parents and making decisions that do not belong to the board. Our education system is, comes from our government and guess what? We need to change our government. We need a government that will listen to the people once again we are people who believe in the Constitution. We are people that believe that we are one nation under God. We are not under a man. We are under God. So I, I pray that you do the right thing because everyone will be held accountable. There's no more for black being called white. Why called black, right, wrong, wrong, right. We are standing and we will not have no twisted agenda placed on our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Kastner. Um, hi, um, my name is Maria Kastner. I think my name will be known to the board, so I don't have to introduce myself. Uh, I'm going to read my statement. We have seen a rush towards mandates across our system of checks and balances since the Biden DOJ came out with their legal opinion that the government can force vaccine mandates on federal government agencies for products that are on emergency use authorization status, which directly contradict the wording in 21 U.S. Code created by Congress, the authorization for medical products for use in emergency which clearly states of the opinion to accept or refuse administration of the product of the consequences, if any, of refusing administration of the product and of the alternatives to the product that are available and to their benefits and risks. The state of California gives recommendations and guidance to the counties, which are suggestive measures. Counties form policies based on their suggestive measures since local conditions like weather Population density and community resources vary from county to county. Gavin Newsom declared a state of emergency in March 2020, yet hospitals around the state were laying off workers at the time. He continued to cling to the Emergency Powers Act and somehow believes that a state of emergency can be indefinite in duration in case we have future outbreaks of COVID-19, which is contradictory to California Emergency Service Act. Governor Newsom signed an executive order on June 18, 2021, while dropping mask mandates, enabling OSHA revisions to take effect without the normal 10-day review period by the Office of Administrative Law. According to the California Emergency Service Act, a state of emergency can only be called if the threat overwhelms the current resources of the state. In the mean, in the meanwhile, the CDC grouped all pneumonia, influenza, and COVID deaths together. They're called the big deaths. The PCR test was never intended as a diagnostic tool, and the parameters for the test were changed after vaccination started. Counties around the country have been liberally counting COVID I'm, deaths and are on record for doing so. I'm, all kinds of thank causes. you. Thank you. Our next speaker is B. Sounders. Hi, I'm the parent of a third grader in the school district. He spent all last year in distant learning, and this week marks 17 months since he was last in a classroom. He's excited to go back and needs to be around other children, and yet we are all worried. The daily numbers of COVID-19 cases and local positivity rates are higher than they were a year ago, and the Delta variant is a far nastier virus, as infectious as chickenpox, three times more so than the common cold. It is hard to understand the push to educate all children indoors at this time. Masks will undoubtedly help, and I sincerely hope there is no relaxing of this mandate. Maintaining social distance will also help, but the science is very clear that outdoors consistently wins over indoors. I am really disappointed that more has not been made of the opportunity to develop outdoor classrooms. We live in a climate where this could so easily be adopted. With the exception of wildfire smoke, a sun hat or sweater would mitigate most problems. What is the op opposition to doing this?
given how much difference we know it can make. Additionally, I hope all staff will be regularly tested, ideally more than once a week, regardless of vaccination status. Unfortunately, it is clear that fully vaccinated people can still acquire this virus, harbour substantial viral load and pass it on to others. Therefore, everyone who is around our unvaccinated and vulnerable children must be tested. It saddens me that we're still so limited in our testing capabilities when we know this can genuinely identify and reduce community spread. So please keep the masks, increase the testing and look again at outdoor classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. President Poor, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you very much. Again, thank you, Dr. Wagenick, for your detailed report. And I wonder if there are any board comments or questions. Ms. Alvarez, please. First of all, again, thank you, Dr. Wagenick. I know this takes a lot of time and um, a lot of effort, so I thank you for all that you do. I know that uh, fellow board members and I share the sentiment that our number one job is to do everything we can to keep children and staff safe. And even before academic achievement, our number one job is safety and to do the best of our ability so that children and staff are safe. And uh, from what I heard you in your report, if I uh, summarize all the layers that we do for safety, we are going to continue, of course, our, the masking, uh, the hygiene, which is the cleaning, the ventilation, the disinfecting. In addition to that, of course, uh, now is the new layer is the testing. And such as the vaccinations and the testing, none of those are forced onto anyone. Uh, you mentioned how the, the parent consent is needed for the testing of students and the parents have the option to opt out. In addition to that, uh, the vaccinations of staff, no one is mandated, no one is forced to do that. There's, there's, those are, uh, of course, highly recommended. None of those are forced. And um, what I heard you say is that we are following the California Department of Public Health, the Center for Disease Control, the Santa Barbara Public Health Guidance, and in addition to that, what we have, I think it's our own personal experience. Our own personal experience of last year when kids were in school, the data that you shared with us, the precautions that we put in place, and of course, our own personal experience. I've been tested weekly for a long, long time. I've had the vaccine. I've had three family members die because of COVID and the fact that they did not have access to the vaccine. So we also have that as a data point. One question that I do have for you, and I'm sorry if I missed this in your presentation, is the goal, uh, which is a great goal, to test 12,500 students and 2,000 staff members the first two weeks of school or three weeks of school. Is that a pooled testing, or are you talking about individual testing? Uh, that is individual testing, and we uh, part of the, on the slide that we had of the steps we need to take is that is that training, and so it'll be the training of the safety administrators on each school site and their teams to be able to then roll that out. So so while we'll be creating uh, the plan for that. Here at the district office, the implementation of the plan at each individual school site will be the responsibility of the principal and the safety administrator. And one more question. Could you please expand a little bit more on the communication for parents? How will parents know about this and their options to whether to sign the release or not about their child being tested? So. Um, we will be doing, as you can imagine, many waves of communication out to our parents using all of our variety of modes. Um, Ms. Barnwell and I have already sat down and started talking about what that's going to look like. The campaign, it really is a campaign of information uh, to keep our kids in school. And so parents will be hearing this week from us 
They'll also be hearing from their principals. We met with principals yesterday. We're meeting with them again tomorrow. And so um, it, it's a full series of communications. So they know exactly uh, what is going on. We also have a meeting. Uh, Superintendent Maldonado is bringing together uh, the COVID task force, which represents parents, community, staff members to advise us on that as well. And so uh, we know that parents have been very interested uh, ever since last week when we started talking about um, the testing, you know, what are the details? What are the details? And so we are going to get those out to them um, in the next few days. Thank you. And I, of, of course, you will also do that in Spanish, right? Both Absolutely. English and Everything Spanish. we do, in fact, um, our, our updated district COVID plan, which we update as regularly as we need to, is ready to go. The reason it's not on our website is because we're having it translated into Spanish, and we always present in Spanish and English. Great, thank you. And uh, one last comment. I urge all the parents out there, the community, to please join us in this effort. It is a community effort. We all want to keep kids in school. The teachers want to be in school with their children, with their students. Please help us mitigate this and control this virus. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. Um, thank you for your report. Uh, I just had one question in regards to uh, logistics of testing. So will students be tested during school hours? And if they aren't, will transportation be provided for students that um, won't be able to get to the testing sites? Um, that's a great question, Dawson. Testing will happen during the school day. And um, so your administrator, safety administrator at San Marcos, for example, will sit down and create a schedule of when different groups of students will be tested. It'll always be the same uh, day each week with makeups at the end of the week. So uh, we need to make it as convenient as possible for students without um, disrupting uh, instruction. By the way, um, this testing takes about uh, 10 minutes per student. So if you have a class doing the testing, about 10 minutes of instruction that will be taken up to do the testing. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to encourage my fellow students. Um, the way that we can go back to normalcy, because I know that's the goal that we all want, is to follow these protocols. Please, if you can, get vaccinated, wear your mask, distance. Um, I know we all want normalcy, and this is the quickest way to get there. So I thank you for your report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Caps. Thank you, Dr. Wagnick, for this uh, incredibly helpful presentation and um, the, the historical examples you used of uh, World War II with your parents. I just wanted to um, commend the, the five ways in which we are using every tool. And I just want to simplify because in addition to um, public health and CDC and the state of California and um, the other uh, the epidemiologists, the person that I rely on for information uh, is, and we've talked about him, is um, Dr. Zha from the Brown University School of Public Health. And he is very clear about what's needed for kids to go back to school. And these are the five tools. And to employ them all, as we are doing, is exemplary. And that's what we need to be doing as a school board. And, I, I, and just to reiterate your goal of all of our goal is to keep kids in school. And so those five tools, testing, ventilation, masks, distancing, which means a minimal, minimization of assemblies, things like that. And obviously the biggest one is vaccination. That's the most um, powerful tool that we have in our toolbox right now. And it's just so important to keep those five um, tools in mind because they are, you know, when you simplify them that much, we see how they work together and how important it is. So just had a question on testing. Uh, Ms. Alvarez already asked the majority of my questions, but one I had was about the fact, um, if you could speak to how we've been testing athletes this spring and even in summer, is that correct? Uh, yes. So the testing of athletes with the BINAX 
intervention. Uh, um, the way that we tested um, students, we need to. The way that we tested student uh, athletes was through the same process, and that was to put uh, the hold on a second. Sorry, I can't hear you. Right. So Lisa. I'm. Yeah. I'm going to call a break um, okay. and um, hopefully this will all end very soon. So I will take a 10 minute break now. Thank you. We're continuing now with uh, item number three, the report on the relocation of Franklin Children's Center and expansion of Adelante Charter School. Uh, Mr. Vizzolini. Uh, good evening event board members, uh, Superintendent Maldonado and members of the public. Uh, tonight, I'm providing an update on the plan to reorganize the use of the Parma site, Franklin Children's Center, and the Adelante Charter. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as a reminder, um, here's a recap of the plan. So we had an addendum to the existing facility use agreement with Adelante Charter that was approved by the board in May of 2018. Um, items included are uh, approval of the use of $2.4 million in Measure J funding that was originally identified for the replacement of portable classrooms at Adelante to demolish the existing Parma buildings and construct a new children's center. Uh, when complete, the Franklin Children's Center staff and um, all their functions would move to the Parma site. And then when that was completed, Adelante would be able to expand into the existing Franklin Children's Center buildings and grounds. Next site, please. Um, so, unfortunately, during design, um, we ran into some challenges at the Parma site um, that are a little difficult to overcome. So we wanted to explain those to the board. Um, and a, a point of clarity, um, the existing main building at Parma is uh, not field act compliant, which means that it doesn't meet current standards for seismic structural safety. And so it cannot be used as a school building. We can't put certificated staff or students inside of that building. And those are requirements by both the California Department of Education and the Division of the State Architect. Uh, another large challenge that we discovered was the space requirements for a preschool. Um, the CDE now requires 35 square feet of indoor space and 75 square feet of outdoor space per student um, on, all of their, on all of their preschool buildings. Um, so uh, what we discovered was that if by the time we build a, uh, excuse me, we construct a building large enough and a, an outdoor space large enough, we're at over 7,000 feet on the building and we're over 13,000 square feet on the recreational area, which leaves very little parking left over. There will be, you know, mandatory uh, American with Disability Act parking. There will now be electric vehicle charging stations that will be required by DSA. And so when all of that gets put on that site, um, What's left for staff and for visitors, parents um, is very, very limited. So there's two options left. One is to have them uh, drop off on Montecito Street, which is um, one of the more busy thoroughfares in the area that conducts traffic from the Upper East Side to the, to the Milpas Corridor. Um, the other alternative is people may end up parking in the Trader Joe's parking lot across the street, which obviously wouldn't be real popular with Trader Joe's, but it's also got some safety concerns of its own. Um, there is no crosswalk in the center of that block, which means families have to park in the Trader Joe's, walk to Milpas, down to Milpa Street, cross the, cross the street there, and then walk another half a block back to the Parma location to get to the site because there wouldn't be enough on-site parking. Um, so we felt like those issues were something that really needed to be uh, brought to the attention of the board. Uh, next slide, please. This slide just shows you a comparison. Um, they are very close together, a couple blocks away, but you can see that on the left, the Parma site is just about two thirds of an acre. And the area that the Franklin Children's Center inhabits on that, on that campus is closer to two acres. So there's quite a disparity in the, uh, the size of the two locations. Next slide, please. Uh, this is probably the toughest, um, other than space is budget. So um, you can see at the top of the side is, is our revenue from Measure J that with the addendum covered, uh, the 2.4 million. And then you can see our construction estimates. We have you know, site demolition and hazmat, 
We have a 7,000 square foot building, which may or may not end up being big enough, but that's what we figure the minimum size is going to be. Um, we have site improvements that include some of the parking we talked about, the lighting requirements, um, maybe some alterations to the driveway because it's very narrow, um, and also the outdoor recreation space that I mentioned would all be part of that site improvements. Um, then we have our 10 consent, or excuse me, our 10% construction contingency, which we have on all of our construction projects. And then we have our 20% soft costs, which are very typical. And those cover items like the architect, DSA inspector, DSA fees, and you know, various testing and inspections that are done during construction on the site. Uh, so as you can see, the total is closer to 7 million. It's a it's quite a bit away from 2.4 million. Uh, next slide, please. So what we have is some options for the board to consider. We realize that this is not time for the action. This is more time to inform the board about what we found out and try and figure out a way to move forward. Um, so some, some possible options we consider are uh, terminating the addendum and to the, to the existing facility use agreement, keep the rest of the agreement in place and let both programs stay where they currently are. We could reallocate the 2.4 million to the classrooms at Adelante, which is where the funding originated from. Um, and that would leave the child development, pro child development program alone as well. Um, the other option is we could consider selling it and maybe the proceeds could go back into the bond program, or maybe they could go into a program to uh, help with the situation at Adelante, but they are issues that we want the board to be aware of. Um, so those were our, our, a few of our thoughts for the board to consider. I believe that Dr. Maldonado has some comments that she'd like to address as well. And then I'll be happy to answer questions after that. Thank you, Mr. Bizzolini. Uh, board members, again, this was the intent of today's report. The intent of today's report for all of you was to update you. And I know it's been a, about a year since we last talked about this topic. Of course, uh, you know the conditions of COVID. I did have a chance to speak to the new executive director yesterday. I know he met today with uh, the principal at Franklin to look at some of the space issues that they have identified as a need. And so we're working out that with Adelante. And again, this is just a report to give you the fact finding issues that we uh, have since this last item was approved, found to be true. And we will continue to update you and work with you as well as the Adelante community to figure out what might be possible next steps. I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you. Ms. Trujillo, I believe we have public comment on this item. Thank you, President Ford. We do have public comment on this item. I will name five speakers. Robin Unander, Justin West, Brianna Aguilar, Roseanne Crawford, and Rianne, Rianne Napoleon. I will begin with Robin Unander. Good evening, board. Thank you very much. My name is Robin Unander. I am a parent for three kids for Adelante Charter School. Our journey started in 2014 with our first going into kindergarten. From the beginning, we parents were assured that Adelante Charter School's physical facilities would be improved. At that time, we had no playground structure. I repeat, no playground structure for our kids to use or play on. We worked hard to raise money for our own funds to buy the playground that we wanted, and we raised the money. But at that same time, dual language immersion programs were coming online and becoming very popular, and the demand for space at our school by other students exceeded the need for the playground, unfortunately. So we had to make a tough choice to expand our school to accommodate the demand. And in doing that, we added two more temporary structures. Unfortunately, that took the, the space that we had for the playground. So we had to sacrifice the playground. And we've been kind of muddling away since then with the idea that, well, maybe someday something could change. But our partner school doesn't exactly easily allow us. You alluded to Franklin and our, our director, our new director, and their principal trying to talk. Nothing is going to change with that relationship. It hasn't yet, and it's not going to. It's a very acrimonious relationship between the schools. Three years ago, Santa Barbara School District made an agreement with us to let us use the two acres literally located right next door where the preschool is. And the preschool will be moved to a neighboring facility with a brand new state-of-the-art facility for them. 
We worked hard with the district to come up with a site plan. We entered into an agreement. You call it an addendum. We call it a contract. It's not a memo of understanding. It was a deal. But then what has changed? Okay, so did the state law change regarding some development? It sounds like Mr. Vizzolini is making that statement. But all of a sudden, we're talking about three times more the cost as well. That wasn't part of the plan when we talked about this three years ago. If the state guidelines have changed, which makes it impossible for time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Justin West. Justin West is not online, so I'll go to the next speaker, Brianna Aguilar. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Brianna Aguilar and I am the board president of Adelante Charter School. Um, I've been on the board for 11 years now and I have a fifth grader and third grader at Adelante. Um, several, a couple of years ago, we began the conversations about um, with Superintendent Matsuoka about expanding our space. Adelante currently sits on nine tenths of an acre and we have 310 students. Um, this is by far the smallest campus in your district and in Santa Barbara Unified. And um, while we know we are a charter school, we still need to advocate for the needs of our students. Um, we have lack of open space. We have lack of space for our special education program. Um, we have con had to contract with the city in order to use the um, parks for PE and dance. And COVID has exacerbated these issues. Um, I am very grateful to Dr. Maldonado and Steve Vicellini for the time that we have spent trying to work out on these issues. And I am hopeful that we can return to our meeting group to kind of find some um, new ways to address these issues. But it is really, really important that we can address these issues. I'm also very grateful to Dr. Maldonado for helping to improve the relationship between Adelante and Franklin. And I am hopeful that there will be opportunities um, to improve that this year. Um, for those of you board members who have not been to Adelante, I invite you to come for a tour so that you can see the challenges that we are facing. Um, just, it is such a small space. And as we address these needs of COVID and having safe places for our students to learn and to eat and to play, um, we really need to address these issues. Um, I'm very hopeful that we can continue our strong partnership with the district and look forward to opportunities to work together to address these needs. Um, we are committed to remaining on the east side where the community that the school was intended to serve. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Roseanne Crawford. Roseanne Crawford here. Just because this re relocation plan was approved under the prior superintendent doesn't mean you have to execute it. In light of the many new discovery staff has made, this direction should be changed. What bothers me the most is about equity. The early education staff did not have a voice in this decision. The Franklin Child Care Center is doing a good job with their center and will probably need more space with the push and money available from the state for pre-K expansion. They need their space on their current two acre site, giving them half an acre at Parma and detaching it from Franklin School is like breaking up a family where many siblings attend. In this, the way you, is this the way you reward one of the best performing schools with the highest scores for Latino families? On the contrary, why should Adelante be expanded at this time? Give the new principal incentive to bring up scores. That small amount of money can be kept aside for improvements that most likely are needed with the current structure. Don't sell Parma land. Now is not the time. Terminate the addendum to the facility use agreement and leave both programs in their current location. The McKinley conversion of the entire school to a bilingual school should take off immediate pressure. However, fall short of equity as the entire conversion of McKinley School to a bilingual school does not leave choice for parents that want one track left in English at their neighborhood school. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rayanne Napoleon.
Hi, good evening. Um, so first of all, I wish that we were celebrating your honoring Juneteenth instead of um, you having to hear about Invermectum and Nuremberg Code. Um, I wish I could buy each of you a, a margarita for every time you had to hear that tonight, but that's not why I'm here to talk with you. So my name is Dr. Rayanne Napoleon, and I am here to request that you honor the commitment you made to Adelante Charter School. As a fellow educator, I have great concern for Adelante and Franklin Children's Center. I'm also a mother of three children, the older of which is entering first grade at Adelante, and the other two are four and 10 months and future students there. Also a chemistry professor at Santa Barbara City College, where I interface with hundreds of students and bridge the gap between students and administrators as the president of Academic Senate. Tonight, I'm speaking solely as a parent, and my views are my own. As I know you know, the elementary school serves a large Latino population, in addition, it is an excellent at providing bilingual, biliterate, and bicultural education. Therefore, honoring your previous commitment to the school serves an equity population and honoring your commitment is the right thing to do. I understand that educational space, especially in Santa Barbara, is an issue that's very important to many educators in my network. And our primary concern is of the well-being of future generations. This is a safety concern and a professional concern. I and other parents are relying on you, our community leaders, to prioritize your previous commitments so that the children of Adelante have adequate space for learning and growing and, and safe space. Thank you so much for um, being so attentive to these issues. I know tonight was just a report, but please keep these comments in your, thought, um, in your thoughts moving forward. As a concerned citizen and a leader in Santa Barbara's educational system, I believe that we have an obligation to vulnerable people in our community, especially our students, and I'm confident that you feel the same. Thank you so much, and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. And President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, Mr. Vizzolini, thank you so much for your report. Dr. Maldonado, did you have something you wanted to say? No. All righty, then I will open this up for any comments or questions from board members. Ms. Caps, please. Yeah, thank you to the speakers uh, and to Mr. Vizzolini and Dr. Maldonado. I, I share the disappointment of this development of, you know, having been, um, somewhat involved in the discussions and understanding how extensive they were for years to get to the point where the board actually passed an agreement. Um, and I, 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 so I'm sort of still in that mode of, of, of uh, learning with this agenda that we can't move forward after it seemed as though a lot of things were in place. And so I do have some questions that are somewhat backwards looking. Uh, I should state um, my overarching support for Adelante and I encourage, as a speaker invited, um, my fellow board members to, to, to visit there if you haven't already. It is just an incredibly dynamic campus and it's incredibly cramped. And they have, they have a waiting list because so many people in this community want dual language immersion and, um, it's, and know about the successes and um, really the magic of Adelante. So, I'm supportive of trying to come to some solution. I do have just a couple questions that do look backwards. Um, why, for example, was an uh, estimate for 2.4 million given if it's actually 7 million? I mean, how did we get to so far along where we actually signed an agreement based on an estimate that was so far off? What went into that? If, if Mr. Vizzolini can speak to that, um, to that figure. And also, it seemed to me at the time, I even toured the um, childcare facility, that they were on board with this when it went to the when it came to us, and now to learn that they are, you know, is rethinking there. So I want to just understand those two pieces, and then uh, and then just want to lend my full support for finding um, as robust a solution as possible, and to reengage in that important and instructive dialogue that occurred. Uh, sure, Ms. Caps, I could uh, do my best here. So the 2.4 number came from the original budget to replace portables at Adelante. Um, at the time, there was never any estimate about what a new building might cost. So, you know, that might be a loophole in the thinking of the group. But, um, you know, the 2.4 million was is a budget number. And as we're seeing on other construction projects, um, escalation is a huge factor. And, you know, right now, 
we couldn't replace the five portables at Adelante with that $2.4 million like we intended back in 2014 either. Um, so that's probably the, the main difference is the cost of construction um, for, you know, the difference in the equity of what could happen at the site at Adelante versus redeveloping and completely redeveloping the Parma site. Um, and regarding the, the Children's Center staff, um, my only, I guess my only input on that would be that um, the biggest issues came up when we, we had initially intended to bring the, um, the preschool assessment team along with them and put them in that same complex so that we would free up more space. Um, and when we started having those conversations, we determined that they could, we had to find a different place for the assessment team. They aren't, they're over at Santa Barbara junior high. Now we just, just recently did that. Um, and so, um, you know, I don't, I don't, can't speak for, uh, the former director, but I know that in speaking with Ms. Ochoa, she just, you know, said basically the, the, the site they're on is much bigger and that's what, you know, that's what she enjoys. Well, thank you. Uh, again, I don't know where we go. I appreciate that some options were 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 listed, but they're pretty vague. And I know that this is just a report. And I, you know, it's always good that you're bringing this to the board. Um, but it, but um, I share the just dismay that we, you know, things weren't moving along as we all. I mean, as a board member, just assume they were. So I, I would just hope that it, we can reinvigorate the conversations and the creativity and and problem solving that's required to make sure that this campus um, and this school has more room. Um, I appreciate that there's uh, hopefully a renewed, with a new director, a renewed attempt to um, solidify the relationship between Franklin and Adelante, um, because that is key to this moving forward and, and so important. Um, so again, just if you could know that at least one board member would like to have regular updates as things move forward here and to re-engage that group that was working um, hand in hand um, for years to try to come to the solution that we thought was on track. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alvarez. Mr. Mr. Vizzolini, since I wasn't part of the discussion back in a, a few years back, uh, was the Parma site, did we know the Parma site was not filled at compliant back in 2018 when the $2.4 million budget was set? We or is did. this, a, so we did know that already. Okay, so this is not a new development. Okay. And um, this new estimate, the $7 million estimate, is that mainly because of cost escalation in construction? Or is it because we found some more issues that we have to add to that cost, to that new cost? Uh, it's a little of both. Um, you know, construction escalation is a huge factor for everybody right now. Um, but the other, there are some things that should be considered too. The site work is not typical for what we're going to have to do. Um, we're going to have to do a complete demolition. Um, we have asbestos abatement and lead abatement in the building that needs to get dropped. So we have air pollution control district issues. Those are all costs that are not typical for like a renovation project that we would normally do. I think the other the other thing to remember is that um, the preschools require a restroom, a boys and girls restroom in every single room. And they're much bigger, as we said, you know, about the 35 square foot per, per child. But the, the restroom facilities have to be there, no, whether you have two kids or a hundred kids. Uh, you have to have, you have to have them in each restroom or excuse me, in each classroom. And then you also have to have public restrooms, right? So the staff has to have restrooms. They can't use the kids. The kids' restrooms are specific to childcare. They're small fixtures that are very low to the ground. The sinks are low to the ground. So it's not, it's also not a facility that we could use for another purpose some other time in the future. So that's, that's an important consideration. Um, and then we also have to add office and reception space which is not typical for our, most of our buildings that we construct. And then the last part is that, you know, the outdoor recreation space isn't just a piece of grass, right? It's, it's going to have to be a play structure. It's going to have to be um, probably places for trikes to roll around and a safe outdoor environment for lots of little kids. So it needs to be big and it's, it's not your typical development on our regular uh, type of project. So I think those are probably the main factors. And thank you. And the, 
10% contingency, construction contingency, that seems to be low uh, based on everything that you just mentioned of all that it's involved in, in, in this project. It seems to me that right now the seven, the projected seven million could potentially be a little bit more. What, what's your thought on that? I think that that's correct, and I will. I would say that the ten percent contingency is, um, it's suspect to change, right? So it's it's going to be based on what our construction cost is. So if our construction cost goes up, then our ten our contingency will go up with it. Okay. Yes, I'm also very much interested in us having a discussion and finding a, finding a solution that works for, for everyone. So thank you for this report. Ms. Munoz. Yes, um, thank you, um, Mr. Vizzolini. And as um, Ms. Caps has expressed and, and Ms. Alvarez, I was also, I was very disappointed with this new, you know, with this news that we received. Um, I also question if if this was known previously, like why the board wasn't informed, uh, first of all, and also the cost that the realistically what the cost is in terms of um, using the, the Parma site. And in addition to that, you know, I have toured the Adelante School. Um, I have toured it and I've also attended the graduation. I've spoken to the parents. And I think that we need to think about our children, our young children that are vulnerable and that have been the parents and the children that has the students that have been waiting for this playground and additional space. Um, I do want to know more, you know, more specifics on this um, as to how we're going to resolve this and certainly encouraged by you know the fact that there's going to be um, energy put into improving the relationship between the two schools that sit side by side in addition to the franklin uh, children's center so i too look forward to to more information um and you know before we are able to make a a, a decision um, thanks thank you and Ms. sims moton Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vizzolini, for, for this report. And certainly, I echo uh, the questions and comments of my sister board members. Uh, and I, you know, and before I make my, my have my question is, I, I have every belief that we're going to come to a solution that is that ends up for the well being and caring of all that's concerned. I have no doubt about that. And, and part of that certainly is repairing relationships, reestablishing it, re engaging in whatever we need to do, because we know that relationships are key. Even when you're in the middle of, of, of challenges, the relationship is the one that can get you through that. So I know that's something that I, as, as some of the speakers uh, spoke about, reestablishing the relationship between Adelante and Franklin. Because uh, as we look at it, we got to make sure that we're working together to ensure that we're preparing, the, preparing our students. Uh, for the world that's yet to be created. Um, and so the, the, the question that I have, the, the 2.4 million, was that, was that just to replace the portables? Because I, I, I'm, I, maybe perhaps I'm confused because was the 2.4 uh, million that was set aside, was that to replace the portables and then uh, look at renovating the Parmer site or are they two different things? They are two different things. So. Uh, there was not going to be a lot of funding put into the Parma building if they were to move into it. Okay. The 2.4 million was part of the original Measure J, and there were five portables at Adelante that were identified in that over 28 or excuse me over 25 year age group, and that's why that's where that number came from. And that you know the other thing is that the cost per square foot of debt of construction has gone up significantly, so that that 2.4 unfortunately is probably not going to take care of five classrooms at Adelante right now either. So there's some, there's some tough conversations to be had about that kind of thing too, the budgets. And, and the question with regards to um, the Parma site, that since you'd have to demolish that all together in order to get it up to code and to be able to fit a preschool with all its needs, and it's not, this is not trying to be a solution. I'm just trying to think it through in, in terms of thinking of the thinking of that. Would it have been better to have the Adelante site there because it's more traditional there as opposed to having to do all the things that it takes to get a preschool, the demands of, of a preschool um, on that site? 
I think that um, I think you might be creating the same situation over there, but it's something to look at for sure. Um, but it's only two thirds of an acre, and so they there would be no space for a large field there. You know, I, I think either way, if you build enough classrooms to house Autolante, there's no more space, and the parking is still an issue. So it's just it's a it's a very small lot, unfortunately, and it's just. I believe it was a home at one point and it was donated to the district or something many, 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 many years ago. And it's, it was never a school building other than just being used as one. Okay. So then that begs the question, is this the best site to use, whether it becomes a new preschool or whether it would be, uh, you know, Atlante just expanding for the classroom. So something to think about that, is that the best use of that for the need that, that, that we're talking about tonight? So something to think about. And I too, I, and I, I, you know, um, I would like for this to be a, a, you know, like a study session to give us a little bit more time. And at that point, I don't want to add on to our staff, but if we can have a little bit more time to talk about these things. And then as, as uh, I think Ms. Caps and also Ms. Alvarez expressed, making sure that we have, you know, regular reports on it so that we can start to continue to do that. And I think if we continue to have the re-engaging of the conversation and see what's best for everyone. And then the last question I had, didn't we do an upgrade on the, um, the fa the Franklin Child Care Center a, a recent upgrade on the yard there we did uh, we did we actually did a heating system there and we did uh, upgrades to some restrooms there the, which were in former bonds um, and also the outside play area so they got a new play structure they got a struck they got a, a storage unit they got um, some artificial turf they got some regular turf they got a bicycle you know tricycle um, course. So yes, they did, and it was it is specific just to preschool kids. It's that size. So, so my what my my question on that would be: Would it make sense for us to having done those upgrades to move them to that? Is there something else we might want to look at? Because I, I I sincerely uh, appreciate and understand and really want to advocate for you know at Adelante the space that their kids need to grow and be you know um, the best that they can be in in a good educational environment. But it, just given the fact that we just did all those upgrades to that, I, I would wonder if that would be the best in terms of moving them from that site to do that. But again, I, I'm looking forward to other reports. Thank you for the work on this and the thinking of what we got to do but, uh, and looking forward to the regular reports. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? If not, uh, Dr. Maldonado and Mr. Vizzolini, I would just say that you can hear that the board is disappointed. And you can hear that this board expects a good solution. Uh, the $4 million delta seems prohibited, but uh, that's why it's going to take the very best um, thinking that we have. And it's also going to take uh, a lot of cooperation between the two schools. I know I will help any way I could. I'm sure every board member feels the same way. We want both schools to be successful and have enough room. Uh, the money is a serious issue, but uh, please involve us and keep us up to date on finding a meaningful solution for both schools. We will do so, and I share your disappointment, uh, as, as I know Do uh, Mr. Vizzolini does, but we will work uh, together to do the best we can with the resources that we have. And we will wait. <laughs> Uh, the next item, number four, that we're, I'm going to is the revised stage, state budget impacts. And board members, I'd like to remind you that we've had a chance to look at this information. And Ms. Hernandez, uh, thank you for uh, keeping your report as, as short and succinct as possible. And Kim needs to be at a microphone. Again, this is information we've had a chance to review. It's a report only. No action will be taken by the board. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Hernandez. There you are. OK, good. OK. Hello again. Good evening. Seems like it's been a long evening, but here we go. Um, and I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Um, so this is a board presentation I wanted to bring to you tonight based on the um, changes that we've had in the state budget between 
May revise and the June 28th um, budget that, that was finally enacted. Next slide, please. Okay, so it's all really good news. We've had increases from the May revise that we're now going to be seeing in our budget. So um, these are the items that I'm going to talk about, and I have slides for each one. But the first one, I don't have a, a slide for, I just wanted to talk to. So this is the LCFF COLA of 5.07%. As a reminder, COLA means the cost of living adjustment. And this was actually in the May revise. Um, I just wanted to let you know that that stayed in the enacted budget, which is excellent. But on top of that, we received um, additional COLA increases in other programs that um, we were all hopeful would happen, and they did happen in the enacted budget. The, um, one of the largest ones was for special education, and that went up um, from 1.05% to 4.05%. So that's a really nice, healthy increase, and we were super happy to see that. Um, we'll go over the, um, the next ones as we go through. So uh, next slide, please. Expanded learning for K-6. So what this is, i take this off so you can hear me. So the expanded learning for uh, K-6, what this is is a no-cost um, summer school and um, uh, summer school and um, after-school programs for students who are the unduplicated percentage, which is the low-cost, um, the low-income students, the foster youth, and the English language learners. So the way that this is going to be calculated, the CDE is going to calculate it based on your overall unduplicated um, pupil count percentage. So the districts um, that have over an 80% unduplicated pupil count will have, will see um, $1,170 per unduplicated student in the K-6 through range. Um, all the, the rest, the remaining of the funds in that bucket of funding will then be um, allocated to the, the rest of the K through 6 LEAs um, based on their unduplicated percentage. And no district um, will receive any less than $50,000. Okay, next slide, please. This is um, pre-K planning and implementation grant. So um, our our state is um, moving towards a um, over the next five years of doing the universal uh, TK pre-K um, for for all public schools, and what and that's going to be fully implemented in the 25-26 school year. So this 300 million dollars that's coming to us this year is to prepare um, for that that process. So um, this year we're going to be receiving funding that is um, just for uh, pre-K planning and implementation of the universal uh, pre-K. So um, we will receive at least a minimum of $100,000 base grant for operating kindergarten programs. And then the rest of the funds will be split of a 60-40 split. 60% um, will be based on the 1920 kindergarten allotment. And then the, the other 40% will be for supplemental grants based on the 1920 kindergarten enrollment, which would be then multiplied by the unduplicated pupil percentage again. Next slide, please. So this one is um, kind of in line with, with the last slide. In order to prepare for this universal pre-K, um, there's, they're going to be, um, there's money in the budget for facilities expansion. So currently there is a full day kindergarten facilities grant program, and that will be expanded to include pre-K and TK classrooms. So in the current uh, grant, there's some restrictions, there's a local matching requirement, um, financial hardships, there's a priority for the grants, all of that will, will stay the same, they're just going to expand it to include pre-K and TK. Um, th this money can be used for construction 
or modernization of classrooms, but it, it cannot be used for portables, not for buying portables, not for um, fixing up portables. It's just for new facilities that other than portables. OK, next slide, please. OK, food service. Um, so through the pandemic, Santa Barbara Unified provided free breakfast and lunch to all students. We are proud that we could have served 1.2 million nourishing meals through this challenging time. And I'm just super, super proud of my food service team. Um, so now going forward, we are um, you know, in person, so we're not, not providing um, the grab and go kind of thing. So um, if we return to what we were receiving, uh, what we were serving prior to um, COVID, that was 30,000 to 35,000 meals per week. So we're assuming that we'll be close to that level. Um, this will be free to all Santa Barbara Unified school, uh, school District students 18 and under. A parent can pick up the food for a student at the site. So in the budget, there was money that was in, um, added to the, the food service reimbursement rates. So the breakfast rate went from 2.375 per meal up to 2.4625. And lunch was similar. There was an increase. It went from 4.1525 to 4.3175. I don't know about you, but I, I don't know how many, how many decimals out we can go on the cents, but we could round that. Um, currently, the cost per lunch is, a, it is about $6. So it's, we're still a little bit in the hole there, but it's, it's getting closer. So kind of like the universal um, pre-K, there is also going to be universal free meals to all students in starting in 22-23. Right now, I don't know what those rates will be, but that's we're really excited about that, that that's going forward. Next slide, please. Um, so kind of like the universal pre-K, getting ready for the universal free meals, um, there's going to be there's money in the budget to get us ready for that. So um, $120 million for uh, at one time, so it's not continuing. It's a one-time uh, amount for kitchen infrastructure upgrades to increase student access to improve the quality of school meals. Um, every district uh, will receive a base amount of $25,000 for this. And then the uses are, the allowable uses are, you know, kind of to help our kitchen infrastructure. So it's cooking and service equipment, refrigeration, storage, and transportation of food equipment between the sites. That's, again, it's just a one-time um, just for this year. There's also a little bit of money in there for um, training of uh, service staff. So I'm, I'm really proud of our food service here at Santa Barbara Unified. All of our meals are you know, scratch meals and prepared fresh every day. Um, bread is made every morning. I just uh, love that. So, um, but there are other school districts that, that aren't there. And our state is really trying to get all school districts to provide really good, healthy scratch meals if possible. So this staff training is um, at least $2,000. It's, it's small, but that's, that's what it's for, is to kind of train staff to get ready for this universal meals, and also hopefully training in, in really nutritious ways of making meals. There's also going to be some one-time federal dollars that is um, to offset the pandemic-related costs. We'll see how those, those are going to show up. OK, next slide, please. Special education. There is um, actually quite a lot of money that's coming um, increases in the special education realm. And I'll talk about each of, of these. Um, there's state money, and there's also federal dollars. There's a one-time increase in, in this school year related to um, the American Recovery Act that President Biden signed. So let's just go to the next slide. Please. Thank you. So the first one has to do with the base rate increase. Um, so the way that the state special education funding works is that in the state of California, we have SELPAs. And all of the special ed funding goes to the SELPAs for each of the school districts. 
and that's how it's allocated out. So it's um, for years there were different base rates where you start the starting point about how the money was allocated across the SELPAs. Every SELPA had a different rate. So the state has really been working to um, make that one rate for everybody. And so they call that the target base rate. And over the past few years, um, our local SELPA in Santa Barbara County was a little bit below that target rate. So we were moving up to get up to the rate that they wanted to use. Um, and on top of that, so we were seeing some increases. And then back in 2021, just last year, the base rate had increased to $625 per average daily attendance. So that's how the money starts and is calculated for each SELPA. By, t by um, May revise, we were looking at that being $650 per ADA, and we were all pretty excited. And then by the time the budget was enacted, um, June 28th, it was $715. So you can kind of see there, I, I've shown what, how much money, the, the money that um, comes from the state is called AB602 funding. And you can see um, how that's gone up every year from 18, 19. Um, so, and also to keep in mind that this will help to reduce the contribution from the general fund to pay for special education because special education is never fully funded. Um, the, the general fund pays for some of the special education. We receive some funding from the federal government and the rest from the state, and then of course some from our property taxes. Next slide, please. This one is kind of, this one is really interesting because this has been a significant change. This is called um, low incidence funds. And this is funding that comes from the state. It's part of AB 602 funding, but it goes directly to the SELPA and is held in, in an account for each district to use. So low incidence funds um, historically for decades has been used only for materials and equipment for low incidence students. Low incidence students are the students that who are deaf and hard of hearing, visually impaired, orthopedically impaired, and they need special equipment and materials. So for example, um, someone who is deaf and hard of hearing might need special stereo equipment in the classroom in order to be able to hear the teacher. Or someone who is visually impaired might need extra materials in braille so that they can read. Someone who has um, who is orthopedically impaired might need extra equipment in the classroom in order to lift them up or to for them to be able to get around. So that's very, very specific items. The state now has changed the way we can use that funds, those funds, in and has added to the materials and equipment and has said now that we can use it for services, which is very exciting because we have a lot of service, a lot of services that we provide students that we can now use this funding for. In the past, um, each year, SELPA would receive about, our, our local SELPA, Santa Barbara County SELPA, would receive about $225,000 per year, and that money was never fully spent. It was allowed to carry over year after year because you can imagine you buy equipment for a student one year, you that equipment would probably follow that student to the next grade. You wouldn't have to keep buying them over and over again in a lot of cases. So there was always a lot of money left over um, that was carried over to the next year. But the state has now um, changed not only the allowable uses of this funding, but they have increased it dramatically. Last year it went up to $1.4 million dollars, which, which means, um, I did the math, that Santa Barbara Unified can expect at least $200,000 that we can use this year, and plus any carryover funds from last year, which I have on good. Um, little Birdie told me that there will be some carried over from last year. So these funds, again, any special ed, extra special education funds that we receive help to reduce the contribution from our general fund. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the Early Intervention Preschool Grant Program. This is kind of similar to that universal TK that we talked about, but it is 
um, only for the special education students. So this is something that um, in, in the year 1920, we received a preschool grant that was similar to this one. And they're kind of, the CDE decided to do this again, and it's um, very similar to that, but the way they calculated it is different. So um, it, what they're using is our first grade students with disabilities as, as the calculation. And you might think that sounds very strange for preschoolers, but part of the issue is that, that the CDE had a lot of difficulty trying to figure out, and we all kind of had difficulty figuring out, was how do you calculate preschoolers with disabilities um, if, you, if they're not included in, in CalPADS or the other form of reporting? So um, the CDE decided to go ahead and use the first grade students as a benchmark kind of for, for a individual school districts, and that's what they're doing. This funding is going to be to supplement existing special education resources. So in other words, it's not to replace it, it's to add on to it, to allow for early intervention of preschool. Um, and it's to support services um, for, for children zero through five years old um, in inclusive settings to improve their school readiness. So it's, it's kind of, you know, again, kind of like that universal pre-K that we're talking about. Um, and, and what's interesting about it is that, you know, when your assessments are not, um, assessments in, for special education are typically general education um, costs because you can't, you, you're assessing a general education population to determine if they need special ed services. So this is actually a special education grant that you can use to assess little kiddos for this. Um, and it's, you know, and it's, it shows you there what the eligible uses are, wraparound services. Um, also, you can use it for professional development to help build capacity to serve these students um, with exceptional needs. So this is a really, um, it's a really good one, and, and we'll have to look at some good ways to use this money. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, alternative dispute resolution. So there's, this one is kind of interesting as well. There's a hundred million dollars that's going to go to SELPAs in the state of California, and it's to assist um, districts in conducting prevention of um, and voluntary alternative dispute resolution, specifically as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic, and specifically as it relates to special ed students and their families. So um, there's of the money that is going to come to SELPA, 80% of it is going to be allocated out to the districts. I believe they're probably going to hold it kind of like that other one in accounts at the SELPA, but we are able to use it. We will not be able to use it for um, legal fees or those kinds of things, but we can use it to work with our families to prevent um, and to help implement any sort of um, alternative dispute resolutions as it relates to the, the pandemic for these families who may have um, experienced some ex significant disruption due to the pandemic. So I think that's my last slide. Is that it? I think so. Does anyone have any, do you have any questions or anything? Okay. Hold on, let me make sure that we don't have any public comments. Is okay. that correct, Ms. Trujillo? Correct, no public comment. Thank you, and, and thank you, Ms. Hernandez, uh, for this great update. Very informative, and as you said, the numbers look good. So, board members, um, there's no requirement that you make any comments or questions, <laughs> but if you've got something burning on your mind for Ms. Hernandez, please let me know now. Okay, one thing, Ms. Alvarez. I promise, only one thing. Uh, thank you so much for this great presentation, so thorough and, and easy to understand. As you know, this current year budget, our projected expenditures are exceeding our projected revenue. So I'm very much interested in doing a real good sweep of the budget yes. and implementing all this new funding and see how we can fix that. Yes. So thank you. That's my comment. Okay, great. Thank you. And Ms. Sims-Moten, please. 
No. Okay. I think you you're mute myself. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. I echo those comments and I just have two quick questions. Do we need a match for to draw down any of these dollars? I didn't see that we did, but just a question. I didn't all oh, I'm sorry, what was the question? I didn't hear you. Do we need a match to draw down any of these dollars? Um, a match. So the facilities grant was the only one that I know of where you have to match the funds. Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to make sure, which which is always good. We don't have to have a match. Yeah. Um, the other question is the one time use dollars. Can we carry them over if we don't spend them in that year? Is, is, are we able to do? Are we able to hold on to it even though it's one time money? But if it, it, I think you said there was one hundred twenty million. Um. Uh, let's see. Which one was the one time use you're talking about? Um. So there's a couple one time uses. I guess it's a general question of right. one time money. Can we draw? It, can we carry it over if we don't spend it? Yeah. I, I will have to um get further information on that. Um. In okay. general, no. But okay. I'll I'll find out for you. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments from board members? And with that, we will continue on. Thank you so much for this uh, excellent report. Um, uh, board members, I do want to let you know that we are postponing the Summer of Learning report until the next board meeting. And I know we're all really looking forward to hearing the summary of this uh, really successful program. So that will take us to our final um, item for today, which is a report from our legal counsel, Craig Price, welcome Craig, about the trustee area elections that we'll be putting into place for the 2022 November school board elections. Mr. Price. I don't think your mic is on. Good evening. I know it's late and you've had a long meeting, so I intend to keep my, uh, my comments brief. Uh, my intentions are to summarize uh, how we got to the point, how you got to the point where you are now, where you are poised to begin the process of moving from at-large elections into district elections with the associated mapping that um, needs to occur. Um, so I'm going to briefly describe why you are here at the point where you are. And then uh, you are fortunate to have your uh, consultant, uh, Jason Rich, who is the CEO of Cooperative Strategies, I believe, who is on board virtually. Is that right? Before I uh, presume too much, I want to make sure that he's with us. Well, can someone tell us? We'll see if he comes on. In any event, I spoke with him this morning and learned that he was intending to um, participate virtually. And I thought it would be particularly important for him to describe the uh, more critical process compared to what I'm going to be commenting on, because his focus is where do you go from here? What does that process look like? What are the considerations needing to be taken into account? And what is the timeline? So um, I'll start in briefly. I think that before 2018, um, there was no school district in Santa Barbara County, at least that I'm aware of, that was anything other than at large, meaning, of course, electing trustees um, where everybody votes for everybody that's running for office. The only exceptions were Allen Hancock College, Santa Barbara City College, and the Santa Barbara County uh, education board, those seven trustees. So what happened? The California Voting Rights Act actually went into effect in 2003, and it was intended to enhance the ability of minority groups 
to be able to either elect their candidates or positively influence uh, their participation in elections. Over the course of time, um, it became a uh, ripe area for litigation. And there were a number of suits, particularly involving cities and counties. And as the courts weighed in on the California Voting Rights Act, it became very apparent that in most instances, there was virtually no defense to a claim because all that was I'm sorry, what Justin, are we looking Justin at? Justin Rich is on now as a panelist. OK, well, excellent. So um, then I can really keep it short and turn it over um, to him. But uh, it became very litigious with attorneys who were filing claims because of the very low bar for proving that there was what's called racially polarized voting. Um, and so one by one jurisdictions lost cases, others started to roll over when threatening letters occurred. There were a lot of legal fees that had to be paid and on and on and on. And by the time we got to certainly 2017, we had seen what happened with the city of Santa Barbara. We'd seen what happened with some surrounding municipalities. And at that point in time, um, some of our local districts, including yourself, decided that it would be a prudent move for you to agree that you would move to trustee area elections, not as a result of a threat, but because you knew that the day was coming, but that rather than doing it in 2018 or 2019, you adopted a resolution that said that you would make that move after the 2020 census results came out. Because it needs to be changed every 10 years. And it hardly made sense to go through the exercise, draw district boundaries, and then have you know a year or 18 months before the next census came out. So you made that decision. A resolution was adopted that I know you're all familiar with. And so now that we are nearing the point when um, the demographer is going to be able to get the essential information that he needs to do the mapping to bring back to you, um, um, you're going to be in a process to move forward through a number of different hearings that he will tell you about involving a number of different criteria that need to be taken into account. One more item that I want to mention that, again, I'm sure you recall, along about the time that the board adopted its resolution in 2018, there was a challenge presented by a couple of your local constituents saying that the law required um, that you actually break up the district into seven and not five seats. And there was some discussion between that council and me and um, I took the position quite confidently that the California Voting Rights Act has nothing to do with the number of trustee areas that were broken up into uh, and that there was no conceivable violation. However, in bringing that request, as it were, from some of your constituents to the board and following discussion, uh, you authorized uh, then Superintendent Matsuoka to write a letter back to the claimants indicating that although there was no legal violation, when the time came, he would certainly uh, inquire into the viability and practicality of possibly uh, breaking the district into seven rather than five um, election areas. And so I believe that um, Jason is going to be prepared to work with you and take a look at that and potentially see whether it could be expected in any way to improve 
the uh, potential for uh, minorities in the community to have a greater say or greater influence in local elections. So um, with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Jason, who I believe is on board. Good evening. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you, Craig. <clears throat> My name is Justin Rich with Cooperative Strategies. Um, as Craig mentioned, I, I'm going to speak to the timeline that's involved in this process and uh, also some of the considerations that go into drawing maps. Um, we are in sort of strange times as, as many things that are, that are affected by COVID. Um, this process is not immune to that. Um, what we need in order to conduct our work uh, is the 2020 census data, which in a normal year would have been released in March or April. Um, but because of the delay in, in, in releasing that data, we, we expect it to have, we, we expect to have it in a usable form in, in September. Um, that has condensed our timeline. Um, so once once we receive that data, we can we can start our process of uh, creating maps for you all to to review. Um, but prior to that, and and what's required in in the election code is that districts that are are moving to being uh, being elected at large to by area is a series of public hearings to allow a forum for for community input. So we're required to hold two public hearings before we even start to draw maps, and that's that's really the first step in the process. Again, the public input process. Uh, those hearings need to occur within 30 days of each other. Um, and so uh, we'll we'll be holding those those maps or those pre map hearings likely before uh, or concurrently with the census data being being released. Um, following those hearings, uh, we will start to draw maps based on the input that we hear from the community from you all. I'll talk a little bit about some of those considerations that that go into drawing those maps. Uh, but again, we're required to hold at least two public hearings. And I'll note that uh, many of our clients are uh, also planning for a third public hearing, uh, just to make sure that they're capturing the uh, starting off with with a certain set of maps, um, taking in some feedback and input, uh, and then coming back and revising those. So uh, that's that's certainly something that we can plan for in our timeline. Um, and, and that's really the next phase of the process. Um, once you have a map that um, that is that that you adopt and, and, and are satisfied with, um, something that you you may have been hearing about before is the, the process of getting an election or excuse me, getting a, a waiver from the State Board of Education um, and removing the requirement to uh, take this change in election method out to the voters in the community. So Senate Bill 442 was just signed by the governor a couple of weeks ago now, and that has taken away that, that waiver requirement. Um, so now the county committee will have the authority to approve any uh, change in election me method um, and the, the trust area map that, that you submit to them. So, so that's good news in this process. <clears throat> um, and I think just a response to uh, the short timeline and the overwhelming um, number of districts that are going to be going through the same thing. Um, so that's, that's the good news. Just in, in terms of the end date for this, um, in order to put this into effect and implement these changes for the 2022 election cycle, uh, the, the, the district really needs to wrap this process up by March. And that includes uh, having gone to the county committee and getting their approval. So why don't I talk a little bit about some of the considerations uh, that, that go into drawing maps. I, I, I really differentiate these in two different ways. There are some requirements that you have to do, uh, and then there's some other requirements that you may want to do uh, along the process. Uh, so first and foremost, the trustee areas must be balanced in population. This is the one person, one vote concept, and uh, it's uh, required under um, un under the federal constitution, the, the equal protection clause. Um, so that is a hard and fast hard and fast requirement that they must be roughly equal. That's been interpreted to be um, the largest and the smallest uh, trustee areas must have no more uh, than a 10% differential in terms of total population. So, so that's the first thing that we have to comply with. 
We also have to draw the boundaries such that they're in compliance with the Federal Voting Rights Act, uh, making sure that they are in compliance with Section 2, and that is that we're not um, we're not diluting the ability of a protected class to be able to, to influence the outcome of an election. Uh, protected class in this context has to do with, with racial uh, minority groups and ethnic groups, also uh, those that, that speak a foreign language as well. So those are the things that we have to do through this process, and we will be providing you with data and um, uh, analysis that shows whether or not you're you're meeting those, and in conjunction with Craig and making sure that we're um, you know we're we're following the letter of the law there. Now, the other things that, that you will want to do is, to, to the extent that you can, draw areas that are compact and contiguous. Uh, now, now, geography can, can be challenging, and, and the district has, uh, you know, a certain shape, and so making areas that are very compact and contiguous isn't always possible when you're trying to balance population, when you're trying to um, consider the, the, the geographic features of the district and, and, and all of those sorts of things. We also want to uh, respect communities of interest as, as much as possible. Um, communities of interest can have a broad meaning, um, and um, but what what it really in what what it really represents is those uh, groups that have shared social and economic characteristics. Um, but again, that that can be a broad definition for for a lot of different things. Um, I mentioned, you know, the, the the geographic features of the district, and um, you know the 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 different things that may um, may be logical uh, boundary lines and and dividing features within the district. Those are the types of things that that we take into consideration again, uh, because those often can be the 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 dividing line between different communities, and so so we want to think about that. Um, there, there can be other local considerations as well, and uh, those I think are unique to each district and something that we'll, we will want to keep in mind. Uh, I know in, in, in the case of your district, the, the feeder districts may be something that, uh, you know, to, to the extent we're, we're looking at their boundaries. Um, and, you know, again, as long as we're meeting those balanced population requirements and, and we're in compliance with the Federal Voting Rights Act, those are the types of things that, that we will be looking at. So, so those are the major considerations that, that go into this. Um, you know, the important part of those pre-map hearings that, that I was telling you about, uh, the important part of, of your role in this is to help identify some of those that are really important for your community. Uh, and it's our job to, to, number one, make sure that we're drawing maps that are legal in, in terms of the law and also represent your community. So, so that'll be our role in this process. I'll pause for any questions. Um, but I think that's that's what I wanted to cover with you all tonight. Oh, thanks so much to both of you for presenting. Uh, I I would love it if you could just help us have a better understanding of. I, I'm assuming you've done this before, Justin. So, what can we expect to learn from uh, the public hearings? Um, I think you will. Um, what, what I've seen in other districts is that uh, there will there will be and and just to, to to clarify those those when when we're drawing these boundaries and we're consider considering those communities of interest uh, and and we're considering other things that that the uh, community is sharing with us we we really are going to focus on those things that uh, keeps communities together uh, and provides for good representation. Um, and so, so you may hear things about, um, you know, there is a certain neighborhood. And if you were to draw the line such that it divided that neighborhood, that may, uh, you know, that, that may split up their influence or their, their shared interests. Uh, and, and that would be something that would not be desirable. Um, you, you may hear um, for, for certain, uh, of these protected classes that that we'll be evaluating within the district, um, Hispanic minority groups and, and and things of that nature. That if we draw the la the the line in in a particular way, that that uh, could have an adverse effect again on that community identity, and that, and that doesn't allow them to be able to uh, have a common voice. So those are the types of things that that I might uh, expect to hear. Thanks, that's really helpful. Board members, are there any questions or comments that you'd like to make at this time? 
I see none. So thank you both for giving us this good introduction and we're looking forward to the next steps. This will be an interesting project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, board members, as you can see in coming events, tomorrow we will be welcoming all new teachers to the district and next Monday there's a graduation for students who completed their requirements over the summer. And as everyone here knows, next Tuesday is the first day of school. Um, take a look at the numerous agenda items that will be happening in the fall. Um, and this is only a partial list just to give everyone an idea what's coming up. And please let us know if there are any things that you would like to have added and we can try to accommodate them in the next two months or so. Our next board meeting is on Tuesday, August 24th at 5.30 p.m. with the board and cabinet masked and meeting in person with the public participating virtually. And as we adjourn tonight, the board and I want to send our respect, admiration, and encouragement to all the educators and supporting staff who will lead the way to a great school year on Tuesday. Let's not lose the excitement that the first day of school brings. And in the words of the poet William Butler Yeats, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And for me, there's nothing more important than that. So let the flames of learning and teaching burn brightly for 21-22. Tonight's meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School Board is adjourned. Good evening. <laughs>